While chatting with my writing students the other day, I mentioned that I wished I had done such a course when I was in my early 20s. Now, I wasn't praising the course as much as I was making a confession about my past self. The 21-year-old Amit wanted to write but knew nothing about writing. He didn't know the craft and more importantly, he didn't know the importance of discipline of building processes and writing habits. He thought he understood life and the world around him, but that was just the arrogance of youth. Like most people, I learned whatever I know by making mistakes. Life gave me hard knocks, I learned. But if I had read more, had more humility, I could have learned faster. If the 47-year-old me could speak to the 21-year-old me, I could change his life, which leads us into complicated science fiction territory because a 47-year-old me may not exist then. Complicated. But my point is this, life teaches all of us important lessons, but it's possible with the right attitude to take shortcuts to learn those lessons from others and as a result to live our lives better that's why i find it important to constantly think about life and writing and creating and all the things i do and to try and build a framework around whatever i have learnt and to share that with others whenever i can and the kind of people i love chatting with on the show are those who do just that welcome to the seen and the unseen our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. My guest today is Prakash Ayer, who is a man of multiple careers, all of them successful. After doing an MBA in the early 1980s, he joined the corporate world, where he went on to hold top positions at Hindustan Lever and Pepsi, among others. As if being a corporate bigwig wasn't enough, he reinvented himself and became an author. Driven by the urge to share his learnings and his life lessons, he wrote a series of books, the latest of which is just out. It's called How Come No One Told Me That? And Prakash further reinvented himself to become a leadership coach, a public speaker, a YouTuber, a modern day creator. He is also an alteration tailor. What does that mean? You'll have to listen to this episode to find out. But first, let's take a quick commercial break. Have you always wanted to be a writer but never quite gotten down to it? Well, I'd love to help you. Over the last year, I've enjoyed teaching my online course, The Art of Clear Writing, and an online community has now sprung up of all my past students. We have workshops, a newsletter to showcase the work of students, and vibrant interaction with much stimulation. In the course itself, through four webinars spread out over four weekends, I share all I know about the craft and practice of clear writing. There are many exercises, much interaction, and a lovely and lively community at the end of it. The course costs rupees 10,000 plus GST or about $150, and the September classes begin on the 4th of September. So if you're interested, head on over to register at indiauncut.com slash clear writing. That's indiauncut.com slash clear writing. Being a good writer doesn't require good God-given talent, just the willingness to work hard and a clear idea of what you need to do to refine your skills. I can help you. Prakash, welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. Thank you so much for having me here, Amit. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, I mean, your books are, of course, incredibly famous. I remember after you signed up for my course, some of the other participants were so surprised that, hey, there's, you know, it's like we, we signed up for Atul Berade's class and we get Sachin Tendulkar himself as one of the participants. Uh-huh. Uh, so c- congratulations on uh, your new book. But I'd like to start not by talking about your books, all the life lessons you've shared, but uh, just your life to begin with, which is uh, so incredibly um, fascinating to me that you spend all these years in the corporate world and then you sort of become a leadership coach and, you know, uh, and in a sense, transform just the way that you kind of look at the world and look at yourself. But take me back to your childhood. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? I mean, I know that you spent a certain part of your childhood in Jaipur where you learned to fly kites and you started learning leadership lessons from that point on when you were five years old. But in general, take me back to your childhood. Where did your dad work? What were your parents like? Uh, How was that childhood? So yes, I was born in Jaipur, Amit, and uh, my dad used to be working in a steel rolling mill in uh, in Jaipur. And I was born in our house in Jaipur. Uh, and there's a little story attached to that because we went back several years later with, to, uh, with my wife and I showed her the house where we were born, but I'll come to that some other time maybe. So I was born in Jaipur. Dad used to be, you know, a, a huge influence on my life. I must, I must, as I look back, my father was a huge influence. He, he left home when he was 18 from a small town called Pirimbavur in Kerala and came to Mumbai. 
a Bombay at that time to work with the railways and came here and then kind of educated himself and got a diploma in engineering. But more importantly, here was this, this man who probably spoke only Tamil and Malayalam who comes and a bit of English perhaps at that time and comes to Bombay and learns Hindi and becomes so good at it that he starts teaching Hindi at the Bombay Tamil Sangam which is really meant to help all these people who come from the South to work in Bombay and don't know Hindi. So he's actually out there teaching Hindi. And I say this because in many ways, that's a memory that kind of stays with me to say, wow, you know, it takes a certain kind of person to do this. And as I look at myself and my children now, I wonder if we have the ability to pick up languages like perhaps another, another generation did. A, a very nice and comfortable childhood, very fond memories of flying kites, uh, of going to school, of going to St. Xavier's in Jaipur and having the headmaster look at my shoes and say, shining shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still remember that. And I, and I keep thinking that if you're in a meeting and if you're in anything formal, hey, make sure your shoes are shining. We moved from Jaipur to Delhi to Bombay. My father used to be in, was in private service, tried some business, uh, which looked like the best time of our life because suddenly we had like, you know, cars and we had bought a house. Uh, but he was in business, which also meant that suddenly we found everything was going away and, you know, Tough times, but overall, very, very fond memories of uh, of growing up, of time spent in Jaipur. Let me tell you a little other a small memory that I have from Jaipur again, which is uh, my father used to be part of the Dakshin Bharatiya Samiti okay, in Jaipur. So one of the things they would do is have these cultural events of some kind. And I remember featuring in one of these little performances. It was a play which my dad had written and the whole thing was in Tamil. But it was songs sung in Tamil set to very popular Hindi film music. So, you know, I, I played a mantri in that little, as a six-year-old or a five-year-old at that time. And the song I had was set to the tune of Chhod Gaye Balam, Hai Mujhe, you know, Saath Hamara Chhod Gaye, whatever that song was, very popular Hindi songs. And I'm saying this because as I now look at the things I've done in my life, I like this idea that you can take a popular Hindi song and, and set it to Tamil lyrics and make it work. And that you don't have to listen to a Hindi film song the way it was. So one of my favorite pastimes uh, as a young kid was to set, you know, to translate Hindi, Hindi songs into English. So I would sing very confidently, my life is a plain paper, plain it remained because, you know, Mera Jeevan Kora Kagal Kora Hi Rehagin. <laughs> um, and I, I'm, maybe I'm trying to attribute too much to it, but it perhaps got me started on this journey of not of looking at things and saying, hmm, maybe there's another interesting way to do it. Huh? Maybe there's something else happening over here. And my father, as you might have guessed by now, because he did theater and stuff like that, so he was a, you know, he was fairly creative in many senses. He got me onto this journey of, of let's say, uh, feeling confident about being in an elocution contest in school or being in a debate in school. And that again, gave me the confidence to say, maybe this is something that I can do reasonably well. Uh, and I still remember as a little kid, I would write letters to the editor, uh, Amit. And in those days, there used to be sports week. And I would write like this, you know, superbly creative piece of work, which would be something like, you know, congratulations, Sunny, for scoring a ton at Melbourne. Keep it up. And guess what? You know, God bless Khalid Ansari. He would actually publish it in sports week. And I would find that my name was appearing in that last page um, you know, with those three lines attributed to me, I would be walking up to a newspaper stall in Mumbai uh, and I would actually sneakily peek into the last page of Sports Week before deciding whether I want to spend a rupee on buying it. And if my name was there, I would pick it up and I would come home. And I think my parents felt so good. Or at least I, my recall is my parents said, wow, what a good thing. And if there was a guest at home, they would show that to people to say, hey, look, here's something that our son has written. And maybe these things got me interested, excited. So I'd write a bit, went to school. I, you know, would be, would debate a fair bit and did reasonably well at that. Would write essays in school. And again, I'm, you know, I'm just looking back to say that as, as you write an essay and I remember class eight or nine, we were asked to write an essay about a person I admire. Okay. And so you can imagine most essays in class were like, you know, Mahatma Gandhi or you know, stuff like that. Uh, and here I am, I wrote about my brother, my older brother, as the person I admire. And it, it, the teacher thought it was pretty cool. Uh, my parents thought it was pretty cool. My brother, of course, thought it was very, very cool. Uh, <laughs> um, and these, I guess, were interesting memories for me. Uh, did reasonably well in school. And when I was graduating, here's another memory. 
uh, my physics teacher, a kind gentleman called Mr. Venu Gopal, he, you know, sees, says, well done. And, you know, I've done reasonably well in school. And so he says, so what are you going to do now? Now, if you're a South Indian boy from a middle class home and you've done reasonably well at school, it's a given that you have to do science and then become an engineer or a doctor. I mean, you cannot think of anything else. Uh, and I remember my physics teacher telling me, I think you should do arts. Okay. But I'm now, this is what, 1977? Uh, you don't do arts. Arts is for those, you know, especially if you live in Bombay. Maybe if you lived in Delhi, there's a St. Stephen's and you start thinking of stuff like that. But it never even crossed our, my mind or, or within the family to say I should do arts. So I did science, quickly figured that engineering is not the kind of thing I want to do, but luckily found statistics and loved it. So I actually did a, a, a BSc, which would have more arts courses than science. I did economics, statistics, and math. And really, as I look back, I think one of the better things I did in my life was to have, have done statistics in college because I think it's, 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 it's hugely uh, useful as a, as a skill to have as compared to perhaps doing several other things you could do. So that's like a, you know, a quick recap of what early years in my life might have been. Yeah, many, many uh, strands I want to follow up on. And one of them which comes to mind is, you know, when you describe your father sort of migrating to the north from Kerala and then learning Hindi and then teaching Hindi to his uh, community. And it seems to me that there is sort of the best aspect of how we, we can think about community in India, that you go somewhere else, but you're not insular when you connect with your community. Instead, you help them adapt to what the wider society, which in his case, he did by teaching Hindi or by, you know, having those uh, interesting crossover musical experiments and so on and so forth. And in recent times, especially, there is also an uglier side to it. Like, of course, this side of it is also a side that lends itself well to globalization and we see it all across the world where our identities are broadening in the sense that we hold on to those aspects of our past with pride and uh, with joy, but also we open ourselves to the, to the outside world. But equally in our modern politics, there is also this strain of becoming more and more insular of uh, these uh, sort of divisions kind of sharpening. Now in your experience from the 70s, 80s, 90s to now, when you look back on this entire span of time, what is your sense of the movement of things like you know when I look at the way that I uh, grew up probably a decade uh, younger than you or so and when I look at the way that I grew up it, it was a very cloistered elite English speaking kind of existence where your received idea of India was all of these sort of feel good Nehruvian things and all of that. But today it seems that the reality all along may have been something else uh, entirely. What is your sense of that? Because what your work also took you out into doing was just interacting with a lot of people who were outside uh, your immediate social circles um, per se. Yeah, and in the kind of marketing roles that you would have done in companies like HLL. Also, therefore, having to understand kind of the pulse of the country. Have we changed fundamentally? Were we always like this and were we missing something then? What are your sort of observations? As I look back, maybe there are two things that are happening or two things that come to my mind. The first, of course, is I think childhood influences, parental influences, I think are very strong for all of us. And I'd like to believe that a lot of the way I might look at the world, the way I might have seen things, was born out of what I might have seen at home. And uh, and in that sense, I guess I was lucky that whatever is the lottery that we are all supposed to have been lucky at in terms of saying that, you know, we were lucky to be born where we were. And I think it's been a privilege. That I think has a huge impact. And as I look at a lot of other people, I've often felt that you come across people who are, who are probably much smarter, uh, have had far more opportunities to do great things in life, but perhaps missed out on some of those early lessons on staying grounded, on respecting other people, on valuing differences of opinion and not trying to, you know, foist your views onto everybody else. And maybe that's something that, that, that has had an impact. I certainly think that it was a much nicer, easier world. And even if I look at it from a professional standpoint, my early career was spent in sales and therefore a large part of the early years would mean going to Tirupur and selling something or going to Asansol and trying to sell more Pepsi or soap or whatever it was. What that does is it, it just opens your eyes to the diversity of the country. 
people are different. You learn not to stereotype people. You learn not to prejudge. And you often realize that now that you are in in Saharanpur, or you know, God forbid, you are in you know in a in, a, in the neck of the woods in Azamgarh, you suddenly realize that you are actually at the mercy of your distributor or your salesperson, and you better learn to respect who they are and what they do. And you can't be expecting them to be like you or to necessarily say that, look, I'm senior, I will tell you what to do. So I think it builds it builds a sense of, I'm not, I don't think modesty is the right word, but a sense of just appreciating the fact that you may be who you are, but learn to value other people, learn to value what they might bring to the table. And very often what they bring to the table is not a function of how much they, which college they went to, or what level of seniority they might have in the organization. So I think that's something else that's become very strong for me. And I sometimes worry that as we become more and more insular, as we start to think or spend more time in echo chambers in with people like ourselves, we start to imagine that that's the world and that we have all the answers and that's the way everybody is. Uh, and we forget that there's actually still a large part of our country, a large part of our people who are very, very different. Something else, Amit, that might that might be interesting here is that uh, my kids uh, and I often think about my children, and you know they went to eleven schools in in you know by the time they finished class ten, and this is largely because I was in roles which required me to move from one city to another to another, and every time we moved, the wife was pretty clear, the kids, the family will move with me, so it was never an option to say, oh my goodness, we've just come here, you go, we'll stay here. So there was a feeling that as a family we must stay together, which again feels a bit like maybe an outdated more or a value to say, hey, why did you do that? You know, you, your kids could have st spent their time in one school. Maybe they would have done better, got better grades, probably got into an IIT, which they didn't. But as I look back, I think it's a good thing. And the kids think it's a damn good thing. They had to make fr new friends every year. They were in a new school every year. And I think they just learned to adjust a lot more, a lot better. And to me, that's a fabulous skill to have. This ability to say, I'll go anywhere, I'll still make new friends. I don't have to worry about, oh my goodness, this has changed. This is not how it used to be. And maybe there's value in that too, yeah. That, that's a very interesting observation. So how old are your kids? What do they do now? They're twins, Amit. They are 31 and therefore 31. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, they both work. My daughter works uh, in HR with OYO, with the OYO Hotel Group. And my son uh, is with Star Sports. He does marketing for the Kabaddi League. Oh, okay. So the same kind of love for sports as you had. So a few interesting stands from what you were speaking about earlier. Like one, obviously that, hey, you were a South Indian boy, good at science, good at studies, all of that. You were expected to do engineering, become an engineer or a doctor, etc., etc. All of those things. Or maybe the IAS has a fallback option. But you chose the private sector. Now, the interesting thing here is that today it's perfectly natural for everybody to want a job in a multinational and so on on and so forth. But back in the day, from what I remember, it wasn't. It was almost kind of uh, looked upon with suspicion. And, you know, the respectable professions are the ones we spoke about, uh, doctor, engineer, IAS, and so on. People would spend years and years giving entrance exam after entrance exam for the UPSC. And I, I also did arts, by the way, in college, uh, which was also looked upon at that time uh, as a very unusual uh, decision. And people were like, oh, you're only doing it because your class will be full of girls, uh, which, which it was. That the, the, the ratio even in the late 80s when I opted for that was kind of uh, like that. So how did the choice to then, you know, enter the private sector and do all of that kind of come about as it uh, did? Was it easier for you because you did not have that ingrained sort of a uh, sense of hierarchy as as in the rest of society where the private sector comes low down because your dad, after all, was an entrepreneur and did all of these things. How did that uh, shift happen in your life? I'm not sure if I can find a moment in time. It's probably a continuum of saying that my parents probably felt that, hey, here's a, a kid who seems to be doing all right, seems to be enjoying what he's doing. When I was in college in Bombay, Amit, I spent afternoons writing copy for an ad agency. There was a fairly strong interest in advertising as a possible career. And therefore, maybe that might have in some sense led me to think of heroes and I remember going to an ad club Bombay meeting where I suddenly see there's a guy called Arun Nanda, who at that time looked like, you know, was really very hot. Rediff Fusion, which is the agency started, was, was making waves. 
And I also happened to hear uh, the then marketing director of Hindustan Lever, a guy called Shunu Sen. He and he was speaking at an event and he was so funny and he had so much knowledge coming out of, you know, out of everything that he was saying. He was funny, he was interesting. And suddenly, maybe at some level, you start thinking of these people and saying, I think there's a hero I can see over here or there's a role model that I might want to kind of follow in the footsteps of. And then an MBA looked like an interesting thing to do at that stage. Uh, and one got familiar with the fact that if you were in school and college at that time, so in Mumbai particularly, I think there was a fair bit of noise around saying MBA could be an interesting option. And that's how I guess I got into, uh, into business school and having got into business school, then and then Hindustan Levers, which is the first company that I, you know, that I went to work with, uh, became a natural progression to say, if you want to do sales and marketing, and if you get a chance to work with Hindustan Lever, take it. And maybe I must tell you a little sidelight here, Amit, which is again, how perhaps some of our decisions in life are. I, I mentioned I went and wrote copy for an ad agency and I really enjoyed it. And I, I loved the fact that I would do something which would then appear in midday the next evening or whatever. At the Institute, uh, I had spent my summer working with Hindustan Lever and there was a reasonable chance that if I had done a reasonable job, I might have got a, get a chance to work with them again. But I was very keen to look at advertising as an option. And David Ogilvy was this god for me. And I said, I want to work with Ogilvy. But Ogilvy wasn't an agency that would come on campus. Uh, so what do I do? I actually write to uh, a gentleman called Mani Ayer, spelled with an A-Y-E-R, who used to run Ogilvy at that time, and tell him that I want to, I'd love to work for in advertising and I'd love to work with Ogilvy. And this is days of sl snail mail. So I've sent it off and nothing happens. And you don't lose heart, unlike in current days where if you don't get a response within a few hours, you start thinking, you know, maybe the guy's not interested. But after a couple of weeks, I get a response saying, you know, great, why don't you come and see me? And I say, you know, I can only come on a weekend because I have classes through the week. And he says, come. So Saturday morning, 11 o'clock at his residence. And I go and meet him. And long story short, four weeks later, I get a letter from Ogilvy saying that we'd love to, to hire you into the agency. And around that time, I've also now got into placement season at Ahmedabad and I get Hindustan Lever. And you know what the clincher might have been for me? Two things. The, the more public view was that I thought to myself that, hey, Arun Nanda went to Hindustan Lever first and then started rediffusion. So maybe that's the route to take. Go, into, go to Hindustan Lever, work there and then get into advertising whenever you want to. The actual big reason was that Ogilvy wouldn't give me housing. And living in Bombay on 1,800 rupees a month would have been a challenge. Uh, whereas Hindustan Diver have these chummeries and even as a young manager, you would get a place to stay. And that suddenly looked like a pretty solid reason to say maybe Hindustan Diver is a good place to go to get started and then you can always try and make a move later on. But I've often felt that, you know, uh, advertising is that, that bus that I let go of, which, you know, I might have enjoyed being in. Yeah, that's uh, the, the counterfactuals are always interesting. You make these small decisions and suddenly, you know, 30 years later, you wonder what your life would have been if you had kind of taken the other one. So you're kind of one of the early MBAs in a sense. You went to IEMA, right? So which is pretty elite right now, but was even way more elite back then because there were uh, sort of so few places in India where you could do an MBA. And one of the things that they say is that the big deal about going to an elite uh, management school is not just what you learn, but also the network strategy form. So the question that just comes to my mind now is when you look back at your classmates and all of that, is there some truth to that? Where are they all? Was it an exceptionally bright bun just because of the selection effect that, you know, so few people actually get in there? Yeah. Um, so certainly I think one of the highlights of being in an, in an institute like that is the kind of people you get to spend time with, the people you find yourself in the company of. And for me, that's been a huge part of my life. I must add that um, a batch senior to mine was also a fabulous batch. And I made lots of friends with, with people out there as much as I might have with, with people in my own batch or the batch junior to mine. So that's really, you get to interact with three sets of people. It's very humbling, Amit, at one level. You get into a place like that and you think, it's natural to think you might have arrived that, wow. And then you promptly get into a course called Maths and Stats for Management and you get a D. And you realize that, hey, this is going to be tough. And if you thought getting in was tough, getting out might actually be tougher. Uh, and that starts to kind of hit you. But uh, Ahmedabad was also a place where I suddenly realized that everybody has their own strengths. And I would never be, I, I could not have become a topper at Ahmedabad 
I, I figured that pretty quickly, but I also figured that, you know what? There's a great idea we've got going here, which is to start a Sunday morning rag on campus. Uh, and we started something called Synchrony uh, and, you know, with a couple of seniors and a couple of us from my batch and we started it. And suddenly Prakash here, along with a few other people, was not just one of those middling people in class, but was actually the guy who brought out that rag, which everybody tried to make fun of, but couldn't pick up, couldn't stop themselves from picking up and reading because it, they were all worried what would we say about them or what would we, what were we saying about something else. So I think in some ways, Ahmedabad also taught me that there are lots of smart people in this world and you learn from a lot of them. They'll challenge you. They'll push you to do better. But at the end of it, we all have something about ourselves that we shouldn't lose sight of. And, and just playing to your strengths can can become uh, you know can become a route a ticket to to success and happiness too. So I could have spent those two years wishing that I was in the top fifteen or I was in the top ten or you know I was a scholar I, I, now I scholar as they'd call them uh, I wasn't but I have lots to look back and say wow I made some fantastic friends I managed to do a bit of writing uh, in those days I would write for the Sunday Observer. And that was pretty cool again. So suddenly you'd find outside the classroom on a Monday, there's a newspaper cutting put up on the notice board where usually you would have grades and all those you know people who've done cool work at work, but you'd also find some chappy who's written a piece for Sunday Observer. So I think uh, as I look back, fond memories, but surely humbling. Uh, and to your point, does the network matter? I think it's it matters at two levels. One, I think it inspires you. Uh, you see a lot of people and, and there are some people who've done extremely well for themselves and you feel, wow, so good about it. You learn another lesson, which is that there isn't a very strong correlation between those rankings at, at the end of your business school and how people might have done for themselves in their lives. There are, of course, a few people who've managed to continue to kind of do extremely well, but there are enough examples of people who will surprise you people who might have been at the tail of the class at some level, but who go on to do extremely well uh, in the corporate world or indeed as entrepreneurs. So, you know, that's something else that's that's an interesting lesson to keep. And another strand I want to pick up on is you said earlier that you're very glad you did statistics, that it made a very big difference. And it also kind of strikes me uh, in my own life that I wish I had studied uh, math much earlier because I think, you know, I began to apply mathematical principles and think of the world using math only after I became a professional poker player in some ways. And that kind of taught me a lot of humility. It uh, improved my decision making. It just made me a different kind of person because uh, once you internalize some of those le lessons and especially most importantly, the probabilistic way of thinking, which uh, teaches you something that is a big part of even this book of yours, uh, the, the, the whole lesson of humility, where you know, you realize how much of your uh, whatever has happened in your life is determined by luck so you don't let you know you don't let your the your successes get to your head you don't let your uh, failures get you down as i kind of keep stressing i'm intrigued by what are the many different aspects in which you meant when you said you know learning statistics made a big impact on you as i think of what else i could have done and i'm just thinking of it um a lot of the stuff that you might otherwise learn in a science uh, curriculum doesn't necessarily find application in day-to-day -day work unless you get to work on that specific science. So, for instance, if you did chemistry and you went to work it with organics or chemicals, uh, you would apply some of, the, some of the stuff that you might have learned in chemistry uh, in the work that you do. I think statistics is probably a slightly more universal subject and has application across potential jobs, industries, and it's, it's almost agnostic to which industry you might be in, learning the principles of probability, uh, and perhaps more than just the principles or trying to say, do I understand how I might calculate the probability? I think learning to think with numbers, learning to think on, the, on what could go wrong, understanding probability, uh, understanding why... 10 tosses of a coin and what happens when you do it 10 times, you know, and what, how people might actually make mistakes in their, in their thinking around, around something as simple as that. I think uh, that's, that's really what I think has been very, very useful. It also makes you comfortable with numbers. And I, I, I still say this, then I say this to everybody that no matter what you do, it's a good idea to get comfortable with numbers. And this is not to suggest that all of us have to be, have 
supremely solid numeric ability or any such thing. But just being comfortable with numbers uh, is a is a fabulous life skill to have. And then to be able to think in numbers and to think in probability and to have that, not have to consciously dive into it to say, oh, I know what to do. I remember reading this in a textbook in statistics or this was in my second year in statistics. But just having that at the back of your mind as a process or a structure that just kind of becomes default and allows you to think, you know, and I think uh, that's useful, whether you're driving a car and trying to take a turn into a blind alley or taking decisions in business or evaluating, you know, should we buy this business or not? Should we sell it or not? You know, do we hire? I think everything that you do, there is an element of statistics and probability that can come in. Yeah. So that's how I think it's usually valuable. So you've already kind of mentioned the chamaris, which for the deciding factor and you're choosing HLL over uh, Ogilvy. So tell me more about your time at HLL. Like what were the impressions you went in with? What were your early learnings there? Like one of the things that I love about your books is that they're peppered with stories from your own life, which carry all of these excellent lessons. But it strikes me that a, a lot of this is you looking back and in hindsight, being able to draw these lessons out from what happened to you back then. But what were you actually learning back then in real time? Like if you had to look back on, say, the big TIL moments on your early years in HLL, you know, what were they like? Tell me a bit about those. So the first one that I learned was that if someone says TIL and you don't know, today I learned is what it stands for, <laughs> ask. So, you know, never take it for granted. And I think you get comfortable with saying that there'll be lots of jargon thrown around. There'll be words being thrown around. If you don't know, just ask uh, and get comfortable with not knowing. I think a lot of the early years in Levers were also about understanding the reality of a marketplace, uh, understanding the, the, the power and dignity of a sales profession. Uh, if you went to business school and you wanted to be a marketing person, uh, and I often talk about this, I mean, you know, I, I, I thought that I would get into Hindustan Lever and have this great opportunity to, to decide advertising campaigns and, and be out there winning an ad club award. And I go into Hindustan Lever and they send me off to sell soap in small town Tamil Nadu. And just going out there and living on 26 rupees a day allowances, staying in hotels which or lodges, which would cost like 13 rupees, which is where your salesman stayed. Uh, and learning to live like a salesman, work like a salesman, travel like a salesman. I think it, it's, it was very, very powerful. So at one level, there was disappointment because after six months, your investment banker friend was talking about how, you know, it's the airport in, in Singapore is so nice. The internet is, you know, I don't even know if the internet was there, but you know, they're talking about international travel, boardrooms, big deals. And you're talking about you know, how the distributor in Polachi is going bust and what do you do about it? And you start wondering, do I really need to learn this? Is this what I went to business school for? To be out there in Polachi selling soap? It teaches you that, look, that's very important. Once you get that bit right, once you understand what's actually happening in the marketplace, once you understand what does a salesperson do? How do consumers buy our products in stores? If you understand that, then that stays with you for the rest of your life. And as you start to make bigger decisions and you start trying to formulate strategy, those strategies and decisions are founded on, on fairly robust basics. And I think that's a powerful lesson that I might have got out of Hindustan Lever, uh, just to understand how business really operates. Something else that influenced me at Hindustan Lever is how the management trainee program at Hindustan Lever sends you through various functions. Six months after being out there selling soap, you suddenly find yourself in a soap factory trying to understand how is soap manufactured. You then find yourself in a role where you're playing, you know, you're calling up truckers and saying, you know, I need six trucks and no, no, I want a seventh one today. It's the last day of the month, have to dispatch. And then negotiating with him to say, give me that same price, don't charge me more. And then you suddenly find yourself spending two months in a small town in UP, in a village in UP, uh, in Eta district where Hindustan Lever used to do a lot of rural development work. So the expectation was that all of us as young management trainees will go out there and make a difference to the people in that village. And, and just spending eight weeks in a village, living in that village with the, with the village uh, dairy head who used to handle our milk business for us over there, carrying a little can, not even a Dalda can, smaller one actually, and going into the field every morning. It teaches you a lot about what's happening in what, how a large part of our country lives. Again, very, very powerful. Hindustan Lever also you know, gave me the foundation to say that understand how things work 
And sometimes the benefit of being in a large organization like Levers was that you saw great processes at work. You saw good people operating them. And therefore, you suddenly understood what gold standard looks like. And perhaps later in my life, it's easy to start saying, you know, yeah, but the people here are not as good or they're not as smart. But, but you learn to work with what you have. But you also learn the importance of then putting in place good systems, robust systems, which will then stand you in good stead. And I think that's something else that I might have learned over there. I also, of course, learned another lesson. So we used, I used to be brand manager on Sunlight in my early years. And it was interesting. And in those days, Piyush Pandey used to be our creative person from Ogilvy who would be coming in and telling us about, you know, aur fir kya hoga, you know, and then he'd tell. So here were the two interesting things that I learned from Piyush. One, of course, is that as a, a creative person, he would only think in Hindi, you know, and everything that he told you was in Hindi. And here you were thinking, this is my positioning statement. This is my advertising brief. And this is what I'm saying. And it was fascinating to see someone turn all of that into, into saying, hey, this is what it does. And I still remember a simple thing. I'll give you an example. Uh, on Sunlight, we were, we were trying to say how we are very good for colors, you know, and how typically, therefore, the, un, the problem we had understood was that if you use detergent on colored clothes, over time, colors fade. And, and then, you know, you feel that, look, this is not a good detergent. And with Sunlight, we said, we've put color guard in it, so it'll protect your colors. And guess what Piyush comes and tells us, and you know, and he says, uh, hai, hum kaise karte the? same pinch. Agar neeli shirt penny aur aapne neeli shirt penny hai, and I'll say same pinch. And she says, Haan, aapne bhi kal di. Nahi, nahi, meri shirt to ye saal purani hai. So same pinch with sunlight, because even though your shirt is four years old, it still looks like new. Okay. And I think it was so fascinating for me as a young kid to see somebody turn a brief a fairly boring brief, I might have thought, uh, into a creative idea to think in local, into in the vernacular, to think in local idiom. Again, I think gives you, allows you a chance to respect a lot of other people who do things very differently from you, but do them well. On the one hand, it's kind of interesting that, you know, you learn statistics and a big company, if you're looking at a top-down view, would look at all of its market as basically numbers. And what this experience does is that it helps you humanize the numbers and get much deeper insight into what they actually mean and what they come from. As you rise up the ladder, number one, do you find that that stays with most people or once they get more and more away from it, the thinking kind of goes back to thinking broadly in numbers again? Like, does one have to remember? mind oneself all the time that that the market out there isn't homogenous that every individual is different that yeah. some of the things that you speak about in your book that don't make assumptions you know always look for new explanations and new sort of ways to do things so good leaders i think learn to do that and as you see other good leaders in action you probably learn to to do that i again go back perhaps to early influences and I, I think it was an important grounding for leaders in Hindustan Lever or in Unilever that you had to spend those first few months or first year out there with salespeople understanding how it works. And that tells you that there is a reality out there which might be different from what you might have assumed. And I think that stays with you. And it's, a, it's probably a, one of those good practices that companies like Unilever have that even now, the chairman of that company will go on market visits, will go out and will not go in thinking he knows the answers. He will go in saying, I don't know. Tell me what's happening. And he'll want to learn from what's happening over there. And I think having a, a both an open mind, not having assumed that you have all the answers, recognizing that I want to learn, that I don't know, I want to learn. And third, also recognizing that the world is changing very, very quickly. And what you might have thought, you know, oh, I know this, I've done this before, I was there, right? Just doesn't work. And you will discover that it's, if you thought like that, you will suddenly discover that you missed the bus because you assumed that people were still stuck in shopping the way they were. And you don't realize that your, you know, that your maid is actually now saying, I Amazon mein khareeda hai. So if she's doing that, she's no longer saying, I don't understand digital or I don't, I have to go back to my neighborhood Kirana store. The world is changing and changing rapidly. And just being aware of that, I think helps. I, mean, I must also add, maybe there's something else about, you know, sometimes it also helps to be not the smartest guy in class or, you know, and I don't think I, so like I said, when I was in Ahmedabad, I was a middling kind of person. Yeah. 
uh, and then when I went to Hindustan, we were someone one year my junior was a man who I thought was such a bright guy, you know, a fantastic guy who went on to actually become chairman of Hindustan Lever. Great guy. And I think you learn to respect people for their abilities, their skills. And, and you also tell yourself that there's space for everybody. There's room for all of us. You don't have to grudge people their, their successes or their greatness. You can, in fact, celebrate along with them and feel good about it. And actually, you can learn a little bit by just looking at other people and saying, hmm, what might I learn from this person? And maybe uh, it helps to not have been uh, on the top of the ladder, as it were, very early and then say, look, I know it all. Yeah. So maybe that's, that's just a natural corollary of that. You were mentioning working with Piyush Pandey on your advertising and that reminded me of one of the most delightful anecdotes in your book where you talk about how as a young brand manager when you would interact with the advertising team you would always be saying isko zada blue karo, isko tinker karo, font asa karo all of those kind of things and at one point your boss kind of called you in and uh, said that uh, listen don't do this your job is just to create a brief they are specialists they know what they are doing uh, better than you do and then this beautiful quote where he said quote why keep a dog and bark yourself a stop quote and that's lovely and what this story also tells us with great humility is a little bit about your own journey of learning to get past that youthful hubris where on the one hand and I, I say this because it perhaps took me longer than you to get past it myself where on one hand you have that hubris that I'm so bloody good. There's that thing of I'm so good and I can do this. And that's a Dunning-Kruger effect at work at one level. At another level, it's a level of you have power over people, right? And therefore, at some level, you want to tell them what to do because you're the one with the power. You want to tell them. You want to show your authority. And that lesson which you pointed out in your own life is sort of about stepping out of the way. You know, when you look back on the young Prakash Ayer, the young version of you, what were the things that changed in him on this journey, especially in the early years and made him eventually the person that you are today? I think a lot of, a lot of lessons learned early in life. And maybe I was kind of built in a way by which I said, let me try and learn this or let me try and understand how can I get better on this one. And you're right. Maybe it's, it's a lot more of now looking back and thinking that, wow, that's something that I learned. But uh, some things just stayed with me. And I, 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 an example, you know, which is about how uh, I had a boss, Amit, uh, called Suman Sinha, who was my boss at Hindustan Lever for a while. And then I went and worked at Pepsi with him, who's been a huge influence on my life and has been a mentor at, at, in, a, in more ways than one. I remember how one of the things that he taught us was that, you know, he showed us a, an org chart for the organization in, at PepsiCo. And he said, he put up a chart. And these were those days of those carousel slides, those 35 mm slides, which you had to carefully put in upside down for it to be projected right in the projector. And I remember how he put up a slide which showed the org chart upside down. And I thought, you know, some trainee is going to lose her job for having done this wrong. And, and so man actually went on to explain that it's not wrong. This is the organization I'm trying to build. Uh, it's an upside down organization where the person at the top of this business is our frontline salesperson. He's closest to our customer. He will decide what this business will do. He will tell us what's the right thing. And below him is a, is a manager whose job is to support him. And below him is a vice president whose job is to make sure that the entire function is doing what the salesman needs to succeed. And he would say, you know, at the bottom of this pyramid is me. I'm, I'm just here to make sure this entire organization is focused on our front, you know, on our customers. And I think that, that just stayed with me. And I thought, wow, what a powerful idea this is because you suddenly start realizing that you don't have power over other people. You're not, you don't have people reporting to you, but you start seeing them as saying, man, I'm responsible for them. I'm responsible for their success. I need to do whatever it takes to help them succeed because if they succeed, I'm okay. I'll be taken care of, you know? That's been a, a pretty powerful little influence in my life to say every time I've had to lead a team and I must confess, I've been sometimes blown away by the, by the smart people I've had the privilege of leading. And I say, wow, what a fantastic person this is. And I'd be damned if I tried to tell that planner, you know, how to get it right. Because, you know, he was, he was so good. My job then was to ensure that I could leverage that planner, get him to deliver and help everybody else in the team to say, okay, now we need to take a decision. So my job was to get everybody else together. And I was very happy uh, not being the smartest person in the room. 
And that usually meant that every time you were discussing something, and if it was something, let's say, to do with manufacturing or technical, I was not a technical guy and there was somebody else who was smart. My job was to ensure I knew how to ask the right questions, maybe ensure we were giving them support that they needed, making sure that people were working together. But my job was not to be the smartest techie or the smartest finance person or the smartest marketing guy in the room. Uh, and that, I think, has been a, a huge almost a transformative piece, I think, for me to say that stop worrying about you. Stop worrying about saying, I must be the smart guy. I must be the guy getting credit. People must say, wow, kitna, you know, what a bright guy this is. Yeah, kya, kya idea hai. I don't think that was, that's what drove me. As much as saying, gosh, can I just make sure that as a team, we get this right? Can we ensure that our collective intelligence, can we, can we harness that to make sure that more often than not, we're doing the right thing rather than the wrong one. And there would be times when we'd still call wrong. There'd be times when there would be debate and discussion and I'd still have to, as a leader, take a call. But I would try very hard to ensure that I had, I had kind of got other people together. Uh, and to come back to your point, therefore, that this whole idea of, you know, thinking that you have power over other people, I think that... That hasn't been uh, the way I might have looked at it. And there's another lesson that I learned. And, you know, this was something else about a, an Arbit line I might have read somewhere, but that kind of got me thinking, which was how there's apparently a bunch of professors in Ireland who did some research on Champions League footballers. And they found that footballers who are two-footed earn something like 27, 28% more than footballers who are good with one foot. Okay. And, and that, that set me thinking and, and I figured later that there's actually a school in Scotland called the Other Foot Soccer School uh, where they wow. teach young children to kick with both feet. Because once you're a senior footballer, then you can't be taught to kick with the other foot. You've got to learn that early in your life. When it's okay to kick with the wrong foot and find the ball is flying somewhere else, it doesn't matter. You're okay with it. And because you're okay with failing, you, you gradually strengthen that foot and you become good with both feet. And I think in many ways, in the corporate world, it's great. It's a great idea for us to try and say, can we be two-footed? And when you're two-footed, you suddenly realize you're not so good with one foot. You're not so good with another function, with another discipline. But you learn to respect other people who are very good at that. And I think having that, humility might be a big word, but just having that realization that, you know what? There are other people who will be better than you in a given subject area. That's okay. Just learn to work with them. Just learn to leverage them and be grateful that you've got good people helping you to get it right. Now, in your book, you've actually mentioned, I think, Suman Sinha in multiple places, including where you spoke about this upside down organizational chart, which sounds beautiful. And, you know, you give leadership sessions and seminars to companies and all of that and where you teach all of this, which also sounds great. But the way most people look at companies is that, look, companies may bohat politics. Hota hai. They think that, you know, to get ahead in the corporate world, it's not about how good you are at your job, but it's about how good you are at managing your seniors and all of that. Even in your book, you know, there are bits about the importance of dressing well and, you know, how the exterior matters, wearing a tie matters, all of those things kind of matter. Equally, along with the politics, there is also that thing that I often say about, you know, politics in the real world, in, in the case of the state, that power always corrupts. Now, the thing is that obviously there are more checks and balances within a private company and the incentives are better, but there is power that, you know, till the checks and balances kick in, you know, till accountability kicks in, even if it's much more than, uh, say, in public life, you know, it, it it can kind of corrupt. So many people, therefore, have a very skeptical view of what uh, corporate cultures are like in many places like, um, you know, when Me Too broke a couple of years back, there was much talk and quite correctly, I think, of how toxic many advertising workplaces are, for example, for women and all those corrosive cultures kind of going through. So on the one hand, I see that you've not only mentioned Mr. Sinha, you've shared your own insights, you've spoken about other leaders through your journey from whom you've learned a lot. So there's a lot of talk of all these wonderful principles, but somebody from the outside could argue that, yeah, they sound great, but the 
reality of corporate India is kind of something different. And therefore, the assumption is that people like you who are trying to improve the culture, like at one point, I think you quote Drucker saying that, uh, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Now, people like you who are trying to improve the culture in these places, improve the way people work, you know, build in all these qualities like humility and upside down org charts and all that. Aren't you pushing against the tide in a way and aren't you also pu- pushing against human nature and the natural incentives at play? So in the course of your career, you know, if, if, if one is to read your book, one would just think that, oh, Mr. Ayer's career has been so remarkable. He has been learning these great lessons all the time and building these enlightened workplaces. But is it, there's a bit of selection bias in there because that's just what you're choosing to write about. Is there the other side also? What is your experience with it? Are there times you were disheartened about about it, say, maybe corporate politics or whatever? Are there times where as a leader, you had to figure out ways to change the culture? What were those struggles like? So yeah, several, uh, several strands in that, uh, in the set of questions, Amit. So maybe let me start by saying a couple of things which have perhaps uh, influenced the way I look at the world. I'm hugely positive. I'm a huge optimist. And for me, the default always is it's a good place. It's a good world before it starts to get proved otherwise. So that's, that's certainly a huge one for me. And I, I, would, I often encourage other people to try and think that way. And you're right. Uh, sometimes it can be, you know, personal experiences can be to the contrary. You can start thinking it's a bad place. And are there organizations and office setups which are political, politicized? Of course there are. Uh, and like you referenced, uh, were there toxic work cultures? Of course there were. But does that allow us to say that therefore the whole world is like that? The answer is no. And here's what I think. A, you've got to believe that that's not necessarily true. And the second thing you've got to believe is you can make a difference. And I often say this to young leaders about org culture. So it's easy to say my organization culture is like this, right? Or we are such a, it's a terrible place or it's so bad and all of that. And I, my answer to that would be, if you have two people working for you, for them, their organization culture is what you do. It's not what HR does. It's not what the global CEO is saying. It's not what's happening in some other parts of your organization. For them, org culture is what you, you as a leader do. So, so my point would be, if you are the leader and you've got two people working for you, set the culture right for those two people, Right. Don't and here it's here's where it starts mattering that don't blame it now on the environment. Don't say the organization is like that. You're, it's a cop out, right? You need to take ownership for it and say you can make a difference. So a be positive about it. I think start with an assumption that things are good. Things it's and that's that's just the way I am. But I'd like to say that's the way you know we could all benefit by being. The incentives are better if you do that. Uh, the second one, of course, is to take ownership for what's happening and say, look, I can make a difference here. Now. What are some of the challenges that we can have when organizations start to get, you know, become bad? I think young people coming into work today don't want to take anything which, you know, they have options. They will not take rubbish from a a boss. The world is changing. They will speak out. There is no fear. There are options available. They will, you know, if they don't like a job, the distance between an argument with the boss and a resignation letter is really getting shorter by the day. This is a great place to be because these young people want to change the world. And if something is happening that's not right, they're saying, come on, I want to take the power. I want to change the world. And if organizations can learn to harness that power and say, let's get this right. Let's try and get people to kind of change it. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what might have happened. In one of the businesses where I worked, we had a a practice where you had to swipe your card to come in. Okay. And that marked your attendance. It marked your time. And of course, you know, good old HR would have policies like four times in a month, you're allowed to come 10 minutes late. But other than that, you will take half day off and another repeat will mean a full day off. Now, this isn't quite anybody's idea of a great organization, but most factories were built this way. And very often what happens is that you start looking for contrary evidence then. And you suddenly realize that if you were to relax it, like I thought I would, and you suddenly start wondering, are there, a lot, are there people who are willing to are taking advantage of it? Are you suddenly discovering that on every time that you have a meeting at 10 o'clock, there are four people who have had work in a school or a bank and are not there in the meeting that day? You know, So why does this happen? But you've got to kind of now understand that this was culture from the past. It may not work. And how do I now start 
thinking of it from that young millennials perspective and say what's the culture that will work for them how do i get this person to feel the need to be in office at time to feel the need to ensure that discipline of some kind matters so i think you have a chance to change culture if you're willing to also adapt yourself you can't be saying culture is what i've decided you try and figure how it, how does this work for younger people you try and take them in to that journey and you try and say look what can i do to make it work one of the bigger mistakes you can make as a leader is to also think that oh, this culture is terrible my previous organization got it right and you then try and come into a business and try and say let me try and change everything over here and that's something else that i referred to perhaps in one of the stories where i talk about you know setting out to drive early morning with your headlights you know you get out in the morning at 6:30 as i did one morning and i didn't think that headlights were needed and i go out on the street and i see lots of cars with their headlights on and i start to think pagal aadmi hai you know why does this man have his headlights on and then i see another car with headlights on and then my wife says you know maybe they left home much earlier so for them they had left home at a time when they needed the lights and they've still got it on because they still think the lights not good enough whereas you came in later and you didn't think the need there was a need for it and i think this is so true for organizations leader comes from outside and he starts wondering why are people doing things this way you know why is why is this man driving with his lights on we forget that there's a good reason why they are doing it that's the way it is that's the way they've been and if you want to drive change the idea is not to try and say you know what just switch off all your lights but to try and understand why do we do things the way we do and i also feel eventually that organizations have been built in such a way that if there is a problem it gets thrown out of the system and that's what a good organization will do it does not allow this foreign body or this virus to stay for too long there will be a bunch of antibodies that will come in and fight that virus and throw it out maybe that's how good organizations are built maybe that's what we all need to try and do to try and get it right one last point amit which is which is a big one i think is around this whole idea of power corrupting and i think that's that's a real risk and that's something that i think we all need to guard against and we need to find systems and processes within an organization where this gets called out there are some checks and balances in place to ensure that behavior which is not right is called out and i think the mistake organizations make is to condone this behavior early on and say it's all right because you know he's such a powerful sales guy he gets you know he's beating his targets every month oh my goodness he has such fabulous relationships with those key accounts if he goes away those accounts will go away with him and we then start to condone behavior which we which is clearly not right and then we expect that when this person becomes senior then the person will change and the person just thinks that hey if i could get away with it as a junior person assure this is the way of the world i will get away with it the other challenge you have in organizations is people tend to follow the leader and therefore you will find in an organization if the leader is this abusive short tempered foul mouthed person young managers start modeling themselves on that style they think that's the way to succeed in this organization and you will find them being disrespectful of other people vendors partners consultants and you suddenly realize that there's a problem over here and very often the problem the rot starts at the top and it's it's the culture that flows from there then and that's something else that you know maybe organizations need to try and set right in your book you've given lots of examples of leaders who've led from the front very well like there is this hll person you describe who visits a small village and they're looking at products in a store and there is a tin of dalda that has dust all over it and he takes out his own white handkerchief and he cleans that little bit of dust and you've given a bunch of examples uh, like that but just now when you were speaking so eloquently about the dangers of power corrupting about you know leaders getting away with stuff when they were juniors and therefore those bad practices carrying on with them and then everybody looking at them as an example uh, you said it with such conviction that it seemed that those are things you've come across in your own career so without naming names or companies or whatever have you been in situations where you have seen that happening where you faced a kind of dilemma that do i just get on with my own career or do i try to do something about this and which is more widespread these kind of bad toxic leaders who are engaged in this constant seemingly ubiquitous political struggle to get ahead within a company or the kind of inspirational leader you speak about who sets a culture by example from the top uh, again it might just be the optimist in me speaking but i think that this toxic bad leader uh, is is really a relic of the past is is probably not quite the norm anymore i think there are two or three things happening one there are no hiding places 
earlier perhaps you could get away with some of this stuff and and you know today if you put your hand in the till you're going to be caught before you do it so this and i've seen this and i've seen this in the sense that you know we've come i've come across situations where perhaps there have been accusations of people being in the uh, and they've been you know found to be true that there were people who were making a mistake but i think the the strength of the organization has got to be in the fact that if it comes to light action is taken the bigger problem is not that somebody's got his hand in the till but that it is allowed to to continue that i think is the is the bigger problem so something i've i've learned and and struggled with i'll give you an example there was a a situation in a business where somebody had fudged a expense statement and it was like some i think uh, 80 rupees spent on taxi fare to go from place a to place b where the controller and the business said that actually i gave that person a lift in my car so they couldn't have spent 80 bucks on a on a cab and this became an, a bit of an issue and here's this person who was doing very well for us you know good colleague nice person and i didn't think this called for the person to be sacked but my boss insisted that we sack the person and we actually ended up sacking the person so i protested a little bit and then of course my boss was horrified that i might even protested but i think i learned a lesson there that if you let this pass you are setting the wrong example and now it's no longer about was it 80 rupees or was it 8 crore if it's wrong it's wrong and sometimes you need to take these hard decisions just to get the message across that that's the organization that's the culture now i think that's a that's a, again a good one and i've seen i've been in organizations where fairly senior people have been asked to have been let go off almost overnight because they did something which violated you know the code of conduct now it doesn't necessarily mean that that person was all bad and it's not as if the person was a complete rogue or a villain it's just that in a moment of weakness maybe the person has done the wrong thing but i think organizations they need to set an example to say if it's the wrong thing it has no place over here too bad we need to set an example out you go that i think is what will help us to ensure that organizations stay on track and this is this is where i'm now coming to that in the good old days maybe there was a little more of this hierarchy a boss was all powerful uh, i still remember i uh, joining a business where you know i commented on a car i had just got into the business and i looked at my factory manager and i said you have a nice car there and he said you know actually the previous boss gave it to him now the previous boss didn't give it to him the organization gave it to him because he earned it he deserved it but this feeling that previous boss gave it to me my boss gave it to me my boss is all powerful i think that also caused a few problems for us where everything the boss did was all right so if the boss made you know did a few other things which are not all correct let it go let it pass that has changed i think today increasingly in organizations and i i use suman sinha as a great example because when i used to work with him in hindustan lever he was sir he was mr sinha and then you move to pepsi a few years later and he's suman and even the truck driver calls him suman you know so that just a culture change but i think it's so important for you to have a situation where the boss is not sir god he's he's not god he's just another person and we need to be able to tell him if there's a problem and i don't know if you saw that little news item i think a couple of days back where air india express have said that the pilot will not be called sir in the cockpit and the whole idea here is that they found that from one of those accidents that they might have one of the several accidents air india express might have had that the problem was that the co-pilot is deferring to the captain and is so respectful that when the captain is making a mistake the co-pilot is not calling it out because sir if you don't mind sir would you mind considering that you are actually losing altitude is not the best way to say it saying baga we are in trouble do something right and i think having a culture which allows us to create more equals to break the hierarchy to call out bad behavior and i think increasingly across organizations things like you know having a having a a hotline or having a, an ombudsman or having systems in place where if you have a problem you can call it out which didn't exist earlier so my my submission would be i don't think that the corporate world is full of toxic bad uh, bad apples um and if anything it's gotten a lot better now with a new bunch of people coming into work and indeed more systems and processes coming into play yeah and that's a that's a wonderful story about your uh, colleague with his hand in the till uh, as it were over a taxi journey and the moment you said that story i said okay i mean i i would just sack him no matter who it is and that's the call that your boss took uh, and it reminds me of this old story by 
uh, I don't know who uh, this is probably apocryphal no matter who it is about but I think it's probably George Bernard Shaw therefore because most apocryphal stories are about him or Oscar, Oscar Wilde, Wilde or whoever thought, yeah <laughs> yeah one of these two where this person asked a lady at a party that will you sleep with me for a million dollars and she said a million dollars you know taking it as a thought experiment and said yes so he said that uh, you know uh, will you sleep with me for 1 dollar and she says what do you think i am and he says i think we've already established that now we are just haggling over price. the price <laughs> and it, it therefore strikes me that this is you know this case of you know an 80 rupee taxi voucher is exactly the same thing it's a principle that matters that today if some guy is willing to do something unethical for 80 bucks tomorrow he'll do it for 80 crore bucks so you have to uh, sort of set your culture there yeah but here here's where i think uh, it matters where you manage you know what your early years are and i think sometimes it's it's a privilege to be able to work with a good boss or a good organization because you learn these lessons early and i dare say there are several organizations where you might say oh come on it's only 80 rupees right you don't sack a person for that and come on you know if that's the case the whole organization will get sacked for example that's the kind of thinking that can happen and i think i love it when you said for instance that for you this was a no brainer right you said if it's 80 bucks or 800 doesn't matter the person goes and i think getting that value in early in your career is really what makes a difference if you grew up in an in a culture in an organization where it's all right i think this can become a problem and i often find this amit when i speak to corporates i often uh, if i feel that there's you know if if one of the things they want to talk about is this whole thing about integrity and culture i will often use an example where i will talk about what do you do when you see a traffic light if the traffic light is red what happens and everybody says we'll stop and i say what do you do when you, when, the, when it's red everybody says we'll stop and then i say but you know are there situations where you've seen people not stopping or you yourself have you seen that it's a red light and you've gone on and suddenly that entire room which said i stop when i see a red light will now say yeah if i'm in a hurry yeah if there's no traffic if it's late in the night if there's no cop right and then i asked the question if you had a chance to steal a million dollars would you steal from your company and the answer is everybody says no 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 i wouldn't and then you ask them what if it's the middle of the night what if the cfo is not looking and and suddenly people realize that look where is this going and i think the rule is that if you see a red light stop it doesn't matter whether there's a cop or no cop it doesn't matter what time of the day it is it doesn't matter that everybody else is doing it none of that is relevant yeah so i try and make this point to say that you know if whether it's 8 bucks 80 bucks or 8 million get the principle right and you'll never make a mistake you'll never find yourself in trouble and i've often found when i say this to some organizations right they almost look at me as saying ye kahan se aa gaya like you know from which planet is this person coming he doesn't understand the reality of our world because you know how can you work in this world without greasing a few palms without bribing that purchase guy in that other organization without doing something which is which is incorrect So I think that's still a challenge, but change will happen. Change is slow, but it needs to happen. And I'm a big believer that hey, eventually that's what should win. So I read about what you just said in the traffic light chapter in your book, and I have a slight kind of quibble with that. But before that, a couple of clarifications. And one clarification, of course, is that like that apocryphal story implies that that woman was somehow doing something wrong, and Shaw or Wild or whoever it was had caught her out. I don't think there is anything wrong with uh, you know making a voluntary decision to sleep with someone for money, for example. That's just one of those traditional moralistic notions uh, that we have. I think sex sex work is as legitimate a profession. and as a podcasting or writing the other clarification is that when i was in my early 20s i might well have you know made a taxi voucher like that myself because i think at that time it was just everything was chalta hai and these are small things and what difference does it make so it is convenient for me today when i don't work for anyone to sit and kind of make these judgments but what do you do in the moment do people get second chances in life and all of that i think those are larger questions so i don't want to be too definitive about this but here's my disagreement about the traffic light and sealing a million dollars thing that the argument with traffic lights and i make this argument often about say speed limits at the wali ceiling which are 80 km but every, the convention is everybody goes above that and it's perfectly safe when the road is empty to go above 80 km on uh, on that particular ceiling is that many of these laws so to say don't actually make that much rational sense you know there is an emergent order which is a conventional way in which people do things which doesn't harm anyone else which has evolved 
like a particular speed at which people go through a road and there is a sort of an imposed order now where in my mind breaking a traffic light at midnight when there is nobody there is different from stealing a million dollars is uh, this that when you break a traffic light at midnight when there is absolutely nobody there you are not harming anybody else you are not inf- infringing on someone's rights right that convention exists traffic lights exist for a reason and people follow it during the day but at this moment in time it doesn't harm anyone where well, you're not doing something morally wrong by breaking a traffic light when the entire road is empty however you are obviously doing something morally wrong by taking a million dollars even if you'll get away with it like you correctly point out in your chapter values are basically what you do when no one's looking which is a, a striking way of thinking about it and this is again on the one hand on the other hand kind of thing because at one level i'm saying ki nahi yaar ye ye nahi ye comparison nahi banta because traffic light i can understand in fact i was in um, new york a few years ago and i was staying at new jersey with my good friend yadajal who's been on the show and i was driving his car at night because i was like let me see america mein kaisa lagta hai gaadi chalana and i broke a traffic light because there was no one on the road and yaza just you know completely panicked and of course got billed for it and all of that so i didn't know the convention in that place and the bombay in guy in me is just saying ki you know koi nahi hai raste pe but the other way of looking at it is that at a normative level if you just follow all rules if you just follow all conventions it's a good thing to do at a normative level don't seek out exceptions and all of that just at a normative level uh, if you remain on the straight and narrow then you can never make a mistake so i just thought i'll share this kind of contradictory notion and this argument uh, about your traffic light metaphor a fair point and I, this is not to suggest for a moment that i have never jumped a red light okay Uh, and but i would very confidently say that i wouldn't want to do the other part of what i might be talking about but um i've certainly the point i want to make here is about decide which are those li- red lights in your life that you want to really hold on to what's really important and the point here is that no one suddenly steals 10 million dollars from a business no one suddenly goes to you know takes nissan into where it it went and we've seen heroes in our lives who after a board meeting have gone and shared data or sensitive data and then found themselves in jail after having done some fantastic work all through their lives and why does this happen and my point over here is that it doesn't happen overnight it happens because long back there was this red light that you didn't stop at yeah and what was the equivalent of that and whether it's that if volkswagen and was allowed a small factory engineer to tamper data right because it was all right it's a monthly report how does it matter it doesn't and to your point it doesn't violate anybody else's rights it didn't cause any harm to anyone else but damn it cost that company 50 billion dollars or more because you know they tampered with pollution data which was wrong and they got caught out doing it and my point here is figure out what are those red lights in your life what are those rules that you want to live by what are those principles that you hold dear and once you have that try and ensure that you don't say it's okay it's only today chalta hai because that will take you down a slippery a slippery slope i think you know and that's that's really the point i want to make no absolutely very wise words i agree with that another question about something that you haven't really addressed in your writings or your youtube talks or whatever that i haven't at least come across but since we were talking about corporate culture and since i happen to mention uh, me too also and one of the things that strikes me is how so much corporate culture is sexist in very subtle ways for example air conditioning right uh, you know the norms for what the air conditioning temperature was were set in the 50s where most people who worked in offices were men and therefore they were set at whatever level is optimal for men and they are comfortable with but the truth is that women's body temperature are sort of modulated differently and they feel colder which is why it is incredibly common that at a temperature where a man is comfortable the woman will be feeling cold and putting a sweater or a shawl around herself and to me this is also a great metaphor for everything in our society just the way that it's designed with men in mind and for the comfort of men and i'm using it now in a metaphorical sense as well that you know a lot of women would say ki theek hai corporate culture might be more open you can take your boss's name by their first name and all of those things but this stuff remains it's invisible like one common complaint that women make and i have seen it for myself happening in this way is that in a meeting uh, where there are men and there are women a woman will say something and everybody will just listen not react and then a man will say the same thing in different words and everybody will be like 
वॉट एन आइडिया अमित क्या बोला है इसको पॉडकास्ट देते हैं एंड सो ऑन एंड अ लॉट ऑफ दिस टफ दिस इनविजिबल वेज इन विच कल्चर्स नॉट जस्ट कॉपरेट कल्चर्स बट अराउंड अस आर बाइस्ड अगेंस्ट वुमेन these were unseen to me uh, and over the last few years maybe some of these layers have started peeling away and one starts trying to actually see what all of these are is this stuff that you notice during your corporate time or you know in your corporate life rather and is this stuff that you wanted to do something about do you think that there are being things done about this what are the sort of barriers to this what what are your impressions i think this is an area where things are changing very quickly and not quickly enough over the last last several years the corporate world that i got into was still very very different and and i think the problem with with biases like the sexist biases that we've had is that we didn't realize it we don't even realize that it happened and i must tell you that in around the time when uh, i was a young sales manager in in hindustan we were we hired women Uh, into sales management training that there weren't too many women there were like maybe a handful two or three or four women who might have been management trainees in sales so the thing was if you hired a management trainee who was a woman into hindustan lever in those days she would either end up in marketing hr or finance but not in sales and the argument and the thinking would be stuff like you know how will you travel into those villages how will you go and deal with the distributors and you have to go and spend time in the evening with the sales guys what will you do and all of that so i think there's a, a as you look back today a load of rubbish okay but i'm just trying to say that this was so deeply ingrained in minds and workplaces tended to be far more male dominated than they are today and i think right from the time if i look at the last 20 years or so i think the world has changed dramatically and the corporate world is trying hard some companies more than others and i certainly think pepsico or unilever great examples of of trying to drive equality in the workplace I also remember and I and I hate to say it but I remember how as men we we often felt oh my goodness why are they doing this you know I, I remember very clearly a situation where we thought there was a friend of ours who was in line for the CFO's job and the the bad joke and I can say it now that the bad joke was that you know we were trying to say that if he has to get that job he has to change his sex because there's a great attempt to try and bring in a woman in that role now I think this is just telling you how bad it was and the the fact that there is far more awareness and i i must say this that i think the world has changed dramatically and i now as i look at workplaces and and policies the conversation has shifted i i must tell you this that i try very hard in in everything that i'm doing to make sure that i'm not saying him naturally i try very hard to make sure that if i'm talking about a boss i'm saying and then she said you know and these are small things but i think they all matter and there are times when subconsciously i might i might have made a statement i'll give you an example not so long ago i referred to something about doing something at work when i was trying to do something while the wife and i said while the wife was on netflix and i actually got a friend writing into me to say not a good thing to say you know why are you assuming that it's only your wife who watches netflix maybe a lot of men are watching netflix through the day while the women are out there working and without realizing it like i said but i think the good news is and i i thought i saw a bit of that just now amit i love the way you kind of came back on that bernard shaw joke because that might have been funny 30 years ago it's not so funny today right the world is changing and i think we all need to acknowledge that and and i think there are lots of women out there in the workforce today who are driving that change there are progressive organizations you know i think just having glues reflecting the number of men and women there are you know very often you'll find organizations where there's like this one tiny room which becomes a women's loo and there's this massive place which is the men's loo why because in the good old days there were so many more men at work yeah. that needs to change i think just the air conditioning not a great example i think just being respectful of what women might need just being respectful of their needs like anybody else's and also i think being sensitive to the differences and creating that sensitivity and and calling it out and saying it is not acceptable i still see situations where there is a leader who will crack this not so okay joke right especially in mixed company it's not acceptable and yet there'll be this nervous laughter around the room and those people say the boss has said it must laugh and there'll be a woman sitting over there wondering what's going on here and i think that will change and that woman is changing the world and she's making sure that that boss doesn't get away with it and i think this is this is a big change happening and like i said i think it's there's a lot that's happening is it enough maybe not uh, certainly a lot more needs to be done but i think uh, 
it's it's such a a deep rooted malaise and i and i'd like to believe that particularly for some of us who've grown up in cities who have been privileged to have women around us spouses daughters friends girlfriends uh, we've learned to respect them and this is still different and and challenging perhaps for a bunch of men coming into work from another part of our country another part of society where it's still you know where women are not being respected if you grow up in a home where your dad did not respect your mom you will struggle with this i think in the early years of your life and i think we just need to kind of enable that change and and recognize that in this continuum we are all perhaps at different points the destination is clear but we are all at different points in that journey and we just need to try and say how can we take people along and make sure that we making it easier for the other half of the world yeah. so you know taking off from your point about this being a deep rooted malaise which i sort of agree with there's another very nuanced point that your book makes which i find relevant to this because while we were talking about this it also struck me that this sexism doesn't come from malice it comes from blindness that people simply aren't aware there are jokes i would have cracked 20 years ago which i would not crack today or that might reflexively come into my head now but i have that filter which stops me from actually uh, saying it and and in your book you speak of course about handlen's razor which i keep talking about all the time in the context of politics which is never attribute to malice what can be adequately explained by stupidity and or in this case the guy just doesn't know the guy has just never experienced this way of thinking he doesn't realize that it's kind of wrong like a friend of mine runs this mailing list where one of the guiding principles there is assume goodwill and the idea being someone says something that you don't agree with don't assume they are coming from a bad place that they're malicious you know one they may be ignorant about something two they may be right and you may be wrong and just assume at least that the intention is good and then you can explore that uh, further but leaving that aside you know your optimism is quite lovely i haven't been in the corporate world for like a decade and a half so your optimism is sort of lovely to hear tell me now about i mean we'll come back to the principles in your book and the life lessons and all that uh, a little later after the break but i want to go on with your personal journey for a moment take me through your corporate journey what was it like number 1 was a job something that you loved doing people think of corporate jobs as oh it is drudgery and i have to do this and i have to earn a living and i'm shifting city so many times in your case was it something that you loved doing and a supplementary question to that would be that were you all the time getting meta about your job and formulating all your learnings from there because what you've done after the corporate part of your career ended is you know brought out all these learnings you know from your career and i would say improved at least thousands of lives by sharing them with the world and by teaching people but was that process of actually formulating those lessons those guidelines those principles for yourself was it a process that was on while you were in your corporate journey it's hard to uh, it's hard to be able to put a finger and say yeah yeah that's that it was always the case and i i completely buy into your point about how some of these things work so well when you look back and you can connect the dots and say that's how it worked for you but what was true amit is uh, is perhaps two things first I actually feel that um, what is it about that little boy from Jaipur? Yeah? How did he manage to kind of you know get into these funny roles and do reasonably reasonably important enough work or in in seemingly important roles? कैसे हुआ यार ये? And I think the answer to that could possibly be that you know सीखता रहा यार kept learning a little bit from other people, kept getting looking at other people and saying, wow. how does this work here what can i learn from this person and i think that that has been a common thread perhaps in my life where i have been uh, maybe a bit of that optimist slash positive guy also where i might see someone who might be having lots of other problems here but i'll still try and figure despite those problems he's doing some he's something is right here so let's try and figure what's right what can we learn from this person and so maybe i kept looking at it in that sense the second thing that happened was that very early in my life i perhaps figured that without realizing it and without giving it a term or a label i figured that stories are powerful and that being able to use stories or tell stories can help you to get your message across so as a young area sales manager running a monthly meeting with eight sales people in a small hotel somewhere wo you know you can keep telling them are yaar theek hai karenge you know have to get our target it looking impossible but you know we will get there you can keep saying it nothing happens but maybe if you can tell them a little story suddenly the mood in the room seems to lift 
and then later that night when everyone's having a beer suddenly that story gets referenced again and you realize that you know you had spent so much time trying to tell them ye karna hai ye karna hai ye karna hai and no one seemed to get it and now you've told them a story and that has stuck with people so i think this tendency or this habit of then using stories started to become something that i would do and maybe that in some ways is as if i was to look at my career and say how do i remember some of those little things maybe that's that might have helped to make that happen it also kind of moved into another part of my life very often i would read an entire book and after finishing you know 340 pages i would remember this one little story tucked away somewhere which is a story that i said wow that was very cool so there is a lot of good stuff in those 350 pages but that little story would stick out for me my kids would often say this that they know what i'm reading by the story i'm telling them at at dinner time you know and i would probably i can't wait i have to tell you that you know what i read this really cool thing and it still happens i would have come across something interesting and i'll want to share it in as much as i talked about air india express and you know saying that don't call sir i just saw it and i said hey this is such a cool story and maybe that's really what has kind of stayed with me through this entire process to say that there are lessons that we can learn and uh, and i how do i put it i i think i was lucky i was lucky that i got to work in some reasonably good business i i'm i'm guessing if i had worked in a business where values weren't so important where the culture was politicized where there were favorites and people were doing all kinds of funny things maybe i would have been a different person i might not have been the person i am yeah i might have struggled with it perhaps but i may not have learned so much and because i learned some of these things i've often felt hey sometimes you see lots of bright people getting it wrong you know and i think wow i wish they also would get to you know learn some of this stuff and maybe that's really what gets me going to say perhaps there's a lesson that i might have learned which can help someone else you know it may be a tiny lesson i'm totally with you on the value of stories like i keep telling my uh, uh, sort of the participants of my writing course as well that you know go for the concrete the abstract to theek hai but go for the concrete and that really makes an impact at which point i am going to ask you to go for the concrete like at one point you mentioned the hypothetical example ki sales meeting chal raha hai and i tell them a story and it comes back to me do you remember any such interesting story which you you know told back in the day where you were actually a sales manager that you know that worked Yeah so I'll tell you a story that we used um many years ago so I used to be in PepsiCo okay and soft drinks was a very seasonal business so if you were in UP for example dukane band ho jati hain it's cold and they really start opening in after holi so march april is when the season will start uh, so jan feb march is a washout as far as soft drink sales are concerned and as a company i remember the boss uh, uh, you know we had decided that what can we do to try and flatten seasonality which meant can we do something to sell more soft drinks in jan feb march now given that our targets and our accounting year was jan december it was a terrible sight to see that the first three months you were doing nothing you were losing money because you know your costs were all in place not getting enough revenue so we said what can we do to sell more soft drinks in in that first quarter of the year and therefore i think the theme was to try and say let's be fast off the block to get jan feb march off to a great start and the way the company looked at it was to say that you know what let's get it off to a great start jan feb march we have an opportunity let's make it happen if you do that if you know four can become 6% 6 can become 8% we are off to a great start the year will be great i don't think it was working too well and and that's when i th- you know i'm a bit of a cricket fan so i came up with this whole thing about how in the good old days in 50 overs cricket the belief was that you start slowly keep your wickets intact and then you know you have the slog overs and then you start to say that that's when you'll start hitting right and, and i talked about how jaisuriya and kaluvitarna actually changed that for us and mark great batch perhaps another level and how just changing the rules can catch your opposition by surprise you can catch them off guard and if we were to suddenly start doing stuff in jan feb march just wake wake up to the opportunity that might be there and suddenly we might discover that we've set a platform from which we can now launch into a even higher plane and therefore a little cricketing story actually got us off to saying that you know what jan feb march could be very different in in a soft drinks calendar year uh, and it it it's not as if we it became the norm and everything changed etc cetera, etc cetera. but it helped us to make to land the message that you know what there is an idea here let's try and make jan feb march much bigger than it is and there's no rule which says it has to be that jan feb march mein kuch nahi hoga and the slog overs will start only in april 
Yeah, and that uh, cricketing analogy is great. And it, in a sense, it also illustrates another lesson that you have in your book, which is that don't assume that the way things were done are still the right way to do them, that you have to look at new paradigms. And of course, that happened with ODI cricket, because if you look at run rates through the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, up to the modern day, where England have taken it another level ahead, that they've just gone up because you changed the way of playing. You Earlier, you followed a kind of a more test matchy structure, and then later on, the structure evolved. And I think in T20, they still haven't, many teams still haven't figured out the optimal structure, where when T20 cricket began at the end of the last uh, decade, at the end of the aughties rather, uh, you know, they transplanted the ODI format that you slog at the start, pinch it at the start, then you consolidate, then you slog at the end. But the truth is because you have the same number of batting resources, but now spread out over 20 overs instead of 50, the expected value, the EV of aggression as it were, just goes up massively and therefore that old structure kind of becomes redundant. So that's still a lesson that I see that many teams haven't got. In fact, elsewhere in your book, you speak about how when you're building a team, you don't want to pick a team with the 11 best players, you want to figure out the best team. And you give the examples of, you know, uh, Kohli's Royal Challengers with Kohli and De Villiers and Gale and all that. And the example of the early Rajasthan Royals. But I think the big mistake that Kohli has consistently made as a T20 captain, and which is why Bangalore uh, have kind of not managed to dominate the IPL despite the riches is a strategic mistake that they simply haven't figured out that you need to kind of front load the hitting and just keep going. That period of consolidation uh, is uh, perhaps uh, overrated. Sorry, that was a digression. But I hope that book is coming, Amit. You have so much to talk about as far as, you know, getting better metrics of performance, looking at cricket strategy very differently in 220. I've heard you speak about this in some forum and I think there's a great book waiting to be written on this one. I actually think it's also a mindset thing. It just goes to yeah. show how difficult it is for, for us to change and to adapt from one to the other. And we our, our default setting seems to be to say the old one will work, you know, and, yeah. and I can stay with it. And then just minor tweaking and we think, oh, I've adapted and I'm now very good for it. Whereas the reality is that you probably need to just demolish it and start afresh. And, you know, the value of a wicket is, is such a powerful idea. And I must tell you a little story myself. Uh, this is Rahul Dravid talking about him becoming a better T20 cricketer in, in IPL. And, you know, he says Yusuf Pathan uh, was his teammate in the Royals. Uh, and he says, I used to watch Pathan play and, and you know, and I was very impressed with his batting. And then Yusuf apparently came to Rahul one day and told him, Rahul, what is your problem? Kya hai and, and he says, you know, aap, you put too much of a price on your wicket. Yeah. You know, you're too scared that I'll be out. Ho you know, you're too, you're, you put too much of a price on your wicket. And Rahul says, I spent my entire career putting a price on my wicket and being lauded for it. And here was this chap telling me, you're putting too much of a price on your wicket. And he says, the rules of T20 are such that don't, your wicket is not so important, right? It's, it's more important for you to be able to score that six or four. And Pathan, he says, would go in five innings. In, in three of them, he throw his wicket away. Didn't care. But in the other two, he would win a game for you because of the way he would bat. And he says, and Raul says, that opened my eyes that maybe I just need to think fundamentally differently about my game because the format calls for it. And maybe that's something that you, you know, you also advocate, I think so. That's fantastic because, yeah, obviously, because you have 10 uh, wickets spread out over 20 overs instead of 50. So the natural conclusion there is that the value of a wicket goes down and the cost of a dot ball goes up. So you have to look at the EV of each action, which as a statistical person, obviously, you're familiar with expected value. And therefore, the expected value of aggression is just far higher. And it's 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 therefore a tragedy when a team places too much of a price on his wickets. And you see they've gone through 20 overs and they've only lost three wickets, which regardless so far much they've scored is a waste of resources because they had hitters in the pavilion who could have you know lifted the rate and therefore they should all have been a little more aggressive as far as my book is concerned yeah I was Westland did ask me to write a book on this which I was supposed to deliver months ago at some point I have to kind of get down and finish it final flippant question before we continue with your personal journey that uh, you know I saw one of my uh, friends Peter Griffin asked on Facebook and Twitter recently that if you are in advertising, have you ever, you know, felt bad about working on a particular product which didn't gel with whatever your personal value system was and all of that. Now, for a long time, you were in charge of Pepsi, which is basically selling sugar and we know that sugar is poison. <laughs> Did that thought ever cross your mind? I don't want to put you on the spot. It's just, just sort of a flippant kind of. No, it's not flippant at all. Uh, I was hugely passionate about Pepsi and 
in all honesty i also survived or survi- not survived as much as saying i was i was there when there was this huge crisis of saying this pesticide in in pepsi you know and we spent a year struggling with it and i think we took great pride in 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 our products and in pepsi and i, I honestly at that time i didn't think of it as being anything wrong i guess the awareness around sugar and what it might do for you and the need to kind of cut it down i think is is Wasn't far there. more now than it might have been at that time um the the awareness now that you shouldn't be selling it to kids versus you know we used to target kids and our kids were were hugely passionate about about pepsi uh, so i must confess that while i was there and while i was doing what i was doing i didn't think of it as would i have gone and worked for a liquor company chances are no would i have gone and worked for a cigarette company chances are no in my mind did i see pepsi that way honest answer i didn't Uh, and therefore that begs the question perhaps that what would i do today and would i you know would i would look at it differently i still think that pepsi still shown that we they are responsible they try to get it right and you know they will not advertise to children they are trying to ensure that their sugar level you know comes down but uh, so to your, to answer your question uh, you know <laughs> i i never thought of it that when i took and for me pepsi was like if they were the best years of my life i i i had a blast while i was at pepsi uh, really enjoyed worked with some fabulous people Uh, i also discovered how being passionate about a business can make a huge difference to outcomes you know and and i also learned how sometimes having a enemy uh, can actually foster that passion we used to joke that apparently there was a saying in coke that if there was no pepsi they would have had to invent it because their entire <laughs> strategy and everything that happened in the world happened because there was this other you know the shark in the tank or an enemy at the door kind of thing and that made a huge difference to the way we might be we woke up every morning saying we've got to win and and you knew that you know you would bleed blue because you were pepsi and i think this whole idea of saying how do you build how do you get a team of people to be passionate about what they do and in the context of what we see in our country and what's happening maybe there's there's there are lessons over here both good and bad in terms of how if you can get people to be excited by a cause they will often suspend judgment and and just do what's required and suddenly the fact that you are weak that you're not spending as much in terms of advertising dollars as your competitor the fact that your you know your brand salient scores are not as high as the other person all that becomes irrelevant because you started believing in a cause which is to say you know what we are going to kill the other guy and we'll become number one you know or or a more milder version a more polit- correct politically correct version of that so you know can work against you but can work for you i think that's the way i'd put it no it, it strikes me that you know passion is a double edged sword in more than one way like one of the pieces of advice that i think i give people which kind of came from early personal experience in the corporate world is that don't get too passionate about your job my sense was that there are people who get too passionate about their jobs a sense of self becomes too deep and then when something happens when they have to leave or something goes wrong then their entire lives are shattered and my advice to them always was that save your passion for what you do in your free time whether it's your hobbies or whether it's something else that you do and um, when you're working work with full intensity give it everything you know that's your dharma you're there to do a job work with full intensity give it all that but don't get emotionally involved with it because if it goes bad it is not worth going through that emotional turmoil for over a mere job for example which almost seems to contradict what you're saying and i get what you're saying as well because you will do anything to the best of your abilities when you're more passionate about it and when And, you know so what are your thoughts on this the world is changing and i'd like to believe that you know the kids at work today think of it perhaps slightly differently than than we might have i don't think when i was in when i was at work we had this luxury of thinking that you know this is work and i will just treat it as a compartment and and then i have this other passion and this is my free time and this is what i will do in many ways they kind of the lines got blurred it all merged if you were not happy at work chances are you were not happy it's not like you could say i'll shut it off and i'll just do what i want to do and i think therefore getting enjoying what you were doing feeling good about it enjoying the people you were working with i think became a huge part of it and i think you can do well all of us will do well if we start to feel that we are enjoying what we are doing another lesson that i think i learned and i try and tell young people is that they, it's not to suggest that there will not be moments that you won't enjoy there won't be parts of a job that you won't enjoy it's it's par for the course but you need to get over those and if you start saying i don't like this little bit so i'm out of here chances are you'll never stay anywhere because there'll always be 
a tiny bit which you won't enjoy and which will then make you say, I'm out of here, I'm out of here, I'm out of here. And then you'll suddenly struggle to say, why am I not getting anywhere? So for me, being passionate about, about what you do and as a leader, and I'm just saying this now, I sold, we sold Pepsi and it was, it was easy to be passionate about Pepsi because you were in those days, if you were on a flight, the guy next to you would be this, you know, snooty guy reading something and he'd suddenly ask you, what do you do? And you'd say Pepsi and he'd shut the book and then tell you about, you know, aapko kya karna chahiye, about your taste, about how, you know, my daughter likes it. My son doesn't like it. Coke is better, not better. I think in your advertising, you should do this. Pepsi was all over. It was such a, it was such a high interest category. It was easy to be passionate about. You had an enemy. But I must tell you that one of the challenges I had was I went and sold yellow pages after that. Now, how boring can yellow pages be compared to colas? And, you know, you don't have Shah Rukh Khan and Sachin Tendulkar telling you, you know, use Infomedia yellow pages. Getting my team to be excited about yellow pages, to be excited about saying, you know, we are doing something special. We are going to help that small business get it right. And getting people to believe in it, I think was an important step for me to get people excited to do more than they might have thought was possible. And therefore, to you know, and for me, that that's what passion might have done for them. And you're right. It is not to suggest that it's the end of the world. If the job goes, if, the, if something, something doesn't work out right, it's only a job after all. But while you're doing it, I think it's a good idea to be passionate about what you do. So two questions. I mean, one, aren't Yellow Pages sort of the Kodak of the informational world in the sense completely miss a bus and gone? And two, when you're passionate about something and does that create the danger that you're closed to the possibility that what you are doing today may be completely irrelevant tomorrow? As I, I, I guess in the case of Yellow Pages, if I'm mistaken, please tell me. No, so you're absolutely right. So Yellow Pages is history. It's not there. But uh, so one of the things we did when we were, uh, when I was with the Yellow Pages business was we tied up with Alibaba. And we brought Alibaba into India. So the Alibaba's entry into India wow. was at some level with, with us at that stage. So just to make the point that we recognized that yellow pages are not likely to last very long. We also recognized that, so we had a telephone answering system and, you know, ask me as a service that we would do. But we recognized even that may not be uh, future proof enough. And really the way to go would be to try and say, how can we leverage the internet to get this right? So you're right. The only difference I'd say is that it wasn't a Kodak moment. We tried to get Alibaba in, but then of course, the way things work in business, businesses got, get bought and sold and get deprioritized. And, you know, um, it's, it, I also say this, Amit, it's, it's always tough when you are running Kodak to see the Kodak moment and say that, you know, it's very yeah. easy to look back and say, what were they thinking? What are they smoking? How could they do this, right? But when you're making, when you're, you know, valued as high as you are and you're making all those billions in profit, it's not easy to say, let's destroy our business. You know, it's not easy. And I have a lot of respect for people who can do that. And I think Gillette is a great example of that. Um, you know, as anyone and, you know, as all of us who might have used Gillette blades, you, you were very happy with Gillette. And then came Mark 1 and you thought, it was, wow, very nice. And you upgraded and you paid a little more. You didn't need Mark 2 and you didn't need Mark 3 and you didn't need Mark 3 plus, Right. But they keep doing this to make sure that they're still giving you a blade, which is better than what somebody else might give you. Uh, and even if it means killing the previous one, they will do it. And I think it takes courage to do it. Um, but as we've learned, it's not about having a choice. It's just about having the wisdom and having, having voices in the system, which will tell you that's what you need to do and listening to those voices. In fact, a great example of this is actually Netflix, which, you know, began as a DVD rental service. And then they killed that business and they did this and, and you know, in a sense, played a part in uh, the massive uh, change that has happened since. Let's take a quick commercial break. And when we come out of the break, we'll move past your corporate career into your role as a teacher and motivator and uh, so on and talk about your book in some detail as well. Long before I was a podcaster, I was a writer. In fact, chances are that many of you first heard of me because of my blog India Uncut, which was active between 2003 and 2009 and became somewhat popular at the time. I love the freedom the form gave me and I feel I was shaped by it in many ways. I exercise my writing muscle every day and was forced to think about many different things because I wrote about many different things. Well, that phase in my life ended for various reasons and now it is time to revive it. Only now I'm doing it through a newsletter. I have started the India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com where I will write regularly about whatever catches my fancy. I'll write about some of the themes I cover in this podcast and about much else. So please do head on over to indiauncut.substack.com and subscribe. It is free. 
Once you sign up, each new installment that I write will land up in your email inbox. You don't need to go anywhere. So subscribe now for free. The India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com. Thank you. Welcome back to The Scene in the Unseen. I'm chatting with Prakash Ayer about his remarkable career, not just in the corporate world, but in terms of really all the life lessons that he has distilled in his many training programs and in the three books that he's written, the latest of which is called How Come No One Told Me That? It reminds me of something like I've recently been binging on the cookery videos of Ranveer Brar and one of the tropes in that and he's it's just delightful, does it really well and he's got these tropes that repeat themselves and one of them is this bit where he says, where he'll warn somebody against doing something and uh, then at the end he'll say Ye mat kehna ki Ranveer ne bataya nahi. <laughs> so, you, you know your the title of your book sort of reminds reminded me of that. Now, while t- talking about your corporate journey, I've tried to kind of get you to talk about your sort of journey to the top where you became CEO and MD and led these great companies. But I can see that you're too modest to go there yourself. Let's talk, uh, however, about both that phase when you're leading these companies and what you bring into it. And also your openness to then reinventing yourself in the way that you did. Like how did that transition happen? Were these thoughts that I will do this, that I will share my learnings and write write books like this, do courses like this. Was it kind of there from before or was it something that happened after, you know, uh, you, you led these companies and was there a moment where you think about what next? And also, I have no idea if you bought a BMW in your 40s, but was there some kind of midlife crisis and what form did that take? (laughs) <laughs> no. So I'll tell you a couple of couple of pointers perhaps in this direction. The first was that something I would do every year is make out a list of resolutions for the year or things that I will do this year. And I can look back maybe to 20, 25 years ago. I, I certainly remember, I think there's a 1998 version of it. There's a 2000 version of it. Uh, which will include things like have a waist size 32, which never happened. <laughs> or have a golf handicap of 18, which has never happened. Or uh, write a book which is also was a recurring part of my wish list or my, you know, what things I want to do this year kind of stuff. Um, and interestingly enough, um, when I was leaving towards the end of my stint at InfoMedia, which is the Yellow Pages business that I ran, it, was, it had got sold to a, to a strategic investor and I was just, you know, I was staying on till I finish. I used to write a blog over there and, um, and the blog was had started to become reasonably popular, which means that, you know, three colleagues and four friends would read it and say good things about it. Uh, And uh, suddenly, of course, I wrote something about tipping in a restaurant and and a lesson that I learned about tipping. And guess what? There was this waiter from a small town in the United States who wrote in to say, what a good thought. And it suddenly struck me, wow, here I am writing a blog, which I think is restricted to, you know, friends and family. And somebody else is reading it and responding to it. And that said, you know, maybe there's something happening here. The blog kept happening. You know, I kept writing reasonably regularly. I enjoyed it. It was like a message to my own team. And then it struck me that maybe there's an idea here for a book. So, of course, I I decide that I must write that book. And I, you know, and this is that year where I'm about to leave a business. And then I'm not sure what I want to do. I'm thinking I'm going to write and speak and do all those cool things. Who wants to go back to the corporate world? So we say, let's make a And I've read somewhere that, you know, the way to do this is you must make a book proposal. So I make a book proposal, which suggests why I think, you know, the best idea there is. And then I send it out to three publishers. I send it to Penguin. I send it to Harper. And then, of course, to keep it easy, I say, let me also send it to Rupa and Jayko. Mm -hmm. You know? And guess what? Within a week of sending it, I get an immediate response from Rupa saying, not interested. And then... A week later, I call up Jayko, who's in the same city where I live, in, which I live in, and which is Bombay. And I call up Jayko and say, "I'd send this book," and they put me through to an editor who I can swear is in the, you know, is probably in the kitchen, and I can hear the pressure cooker go off. And and she says, "You know, we do too many of this kind of book. Tell me what is it about?" And I suddenly discover there's something called an elevator pitch, which I don't have. Nothing happens, and then of course a book starts to happen, and the Penguin responds three months later. I say, and says that, you know what, we, she, the editor, lady, kind lady called Heather Adams writes to me and says, I've liked what I've read. I'd love to make it a book and we'd love to work with you. And I think this is like dream come true. So maybe that's one watershed moment of sorts where the book happens uh, and that starts to change things for me. And maybe I'll come back to what might it, what it might do for me over there. 
let me go back a little bit and say that something else that I that might have made a difference was that um, I, I I know this this is popular ikigai kind of the book and the idea and I think the idea is pretty powerful and and somewhere along the way I guess I started to figure this for myself that you know maybe what can give me happiness is if I can work in that sweet spot where I'm doing something that I'm reasonably good at that I'm uniquely good at something that I enjoy doing. Uh, something that has value in this world and will make a difference. So if I can kind of find the intersection of those four circles, maybe I'll be in a sweet spot. And that for me starts to kind of work to say, this might just be an interesting space to be. And I still remember that, you know, from conferences in businesses from many years ago, I would, I would be that, I would speak and people would think, wow, that was, no one came and told me, I think that was such a great strategic decision. This is going to change our market share. But they would probably come and tell me, Yar, maza gaya. that was, you know, that or, or people, bottlers or distributors would come and say that was very interesting. So again, looking back, I would feel that maybe there's something that I have over there as a, as a strength. I met a man called Brian Tracy when I was running Infomedia. Brian Tracy is this, you know, is an American motivational speaker, bit of those, one of those guru kind of guys, been around for a long time, written like a million books and, and a few million tapes sold, et cetera, et cetera. And I told him, I want to be a speaker. I want to quit all this corporate world and become a, a speaker and become a motivational speaker. Like, you know, so, so he said to me, he said, you know what? Uh, I, don't do that. Don't be in a hurry to quit and do this. You start to speak. You speak 200 times. Speak at the Rotary Club. Speak in your school. Speak in your local complex. Speak wherever you get invited. Just speak. And if you've spoken 200 times, Two things would have happened. One, see if you still enjoy it after you've spoken 200 times. And two, see if 200 people call you. And it's quite likely that you don't get to that 200 number. But if both these happen, then you're probably in a place where you can say, yep, I still want to do it. And what happened for me was when, I, when the book was out, it got me a lot of opportunities to speak around the book. So lots of friends in other companies, HR folks would all call me and say, come speak to colleges would call me and say, speak about the book. And the book started, you know, the book was the habit of winning. And I just enjoyed sharing stories about winning, which is big stories from Pepsi, from soap, from cricket, whatever it was. And I started to speak. And I, I actually literally took that 200 speaking engagement seriously. And I did that. And I started to enjoy it. And then by then, of course, the second book happened. And then there started being conflict. I got invited to speak at a TEDx event. And it clashed with my global CEO's visit to India, which happened, you know, and therefore I couldn't do the TEDx talk, which at that time, TEDx was still happening. It was still something special in that sense. And I thought, oh gosh, missing an opportunity. And, and I guess uh, somewhere along the way, this, you know, a second book happened. Speaking was giving me great joy. Uh, I'd be at an airport where some guy would come up to me and say, sir, you remember, or you had come to our company event or you came and spoke. And, you know, we, I need to repeat something I might have said. I thought this is, this is so cool. This is what I want to do. And literally, you know, I, I, I really asked myself that question. If I was to be run over by a bus tomorrow morning, what is it that I would really regret not having done? You know, and I didn't think I'd answer wasn't that I wish I'd bought a bigger BMW or a bigger house or a big or more stock options or more money. I, I that didn't re and this is not trying to sound immodest. Or I didn't have a BMW to start with, but that was not the point. It didn't didn't excite me. It wasn't why I thought. Wow, that's what's going to be cool. For me, the cool bit was, wow, I'd love to go out and be this guy who writes a lot more, who speaks a lot more. My ideal, my world had this, this lovely image of my grandchild climbing up an attic and pulling out a book and saying, you know what, my granddad wrote this, you know, just that feeling of saying, maybe there's a legacy there. Uh, the fact that, you know, market cap went up in my business and our investors made more money or that market share went up or that we launched this terrific product. All of that seemed to pale into insignificance in a sense to say that, and this is not to say that's not important. It's just that to me, that didn't seem like the big deal. For me, it felt like what a life it could be. I'd have so much fun. It wouldn't be work for me if I could just go out and speak about stuff that I'm passionate about. Life would be so good for me if I could go out and write the stuff that I, I seem to be enjoying. And if I can use some of what I've learned to help other people get just a bit better. And that's where perhaps this coaching bit, you know, was a bug that had bitten me much earlier. And I trained to become a coach just to say that, can I help formalize a process by which I can help other people to get just a bit better than they might be? So this really looked like what I want to do. And, and then, of course, you know, came the conversation with the spouse, to, with my wife, and she was usually supportive. And I did tell her, look, I'm going to do this not because it's going to make money for us. I'm, I'm assuming that I, if I don't make a penny from here, 
my CA has told me that, look, don't worry. You know, we wouldn't have to kind of be on the, you know, we don't have to worry about food, clothing and shelter. And indeed, that little holiday and, and that little whatever else that is our indulgence. Don't worry about it. But it's not like we can suddenly say, now I want a bigger home and I want more and more and more. That's not going to happen. But I'm going to have fun. I think I'll, I'll love this year. And that's how I think the, the transition. So the transition happened by the time th- there were two books out. I had been speaking uh, for nothing. I mean, I wouldn't make a penny out of my speaking. But I could see that what I was doing could also, could also get me, you know, could pay the bills, could make some money. But really, the driver was, that's what I thought I wanted to be, you know, my chance at being Prakash Ayer, that one, that one little purpose for which maybe, maybe I was meant to do. That's that's what it sounded like for me. Yeah, yeah that, that's a, that's a lovely story about your passion shifting from one P to another, from Pepsi to Prakash. And it strikes me that just in this story of your life, there are uh, life lessons for people uh, to learn. In fact, one of which is a chapter in your book and is also something uh, coincidentally that I spoke about last week when I did an episode on creators with Roshan Abbas, where one of the things we chatted about was the importance of quantity over quality. Uh, not in so many words. This is, uh, you know, I got these exact words from your chapter on the subject. And, uh, you know, you spoke about the advice you got to speak 200 times. And similarly, I mentioned to Roshan how I was struck by uh, the YouTuber Ali Abdal's uh, advice to young YouTubers that for, you know, make 200 videos, literally two videos a week for two years uh, before you look at the metrics. Just do that and just the constant iteration will make you better. And you've got a great chapter on this, which uh, you begin with a lovely quote by G.K. Chesterton, a quote, anything worth doing is worth doing badly, stop quote. And then you give a great example of the ceramic pots. Uh, you, you know, you, you read it as did I a long time ago from this book called Art and Fear by David Bales and Ted Orland, as you pointed out. And it's a fantastic experiment with a key lesson at the end of it. So you, you want to repeat for my listeners uh, what it is and how, the lesson that we then arrive at? Yeah. So uh, one of the things that fascinates me is this, we all get told that something is better than something else. And that becomes like a norm. And what I want to do is to tell ourselves that maybe that's the norm, but learn to challenge it. And it may not always be the case and look for where the outliers might be. And an example of that was, this thing that we always heard, right? Quality is better than quantity. I mean, we've used it to our own advantage at several, I'm sure, you know, we can all relate to this quality over quantity. And this is an experiment in, in, a, in a ceramics class, apparently, where the teacher decides that she, she does an experiment. She says that you'd be judged in this class at the end of the term on one of two parameters. You could either go f- for the quality route or for the quantity route, which is very simple. So if you take the quality option, you can spend the next term making your best pot and come back and at the end of it if your pot is perfect you'll get an A if it's good you'll get a B if it's not so good a C and if it's terrible a D and in the other case if you had to go the quantity route what you would need to do is I'll bring a weighing machine at the end of the term and all the pots you've made we'll put on the weighing machine if you've made more than 70 kilos you get an A if it's 50 kilos you get a B if it's 30 you get a C etc etc The interesting bit, of course, is that some students chose the quality route and some the quantity route. And at the end of the term, what they found was that the finest pot that emerged in class, the finest set of pots that emerged were not from the quality group. They were from the quantity group. The kids who were focused on delivering this great pot were thinking of the great pot, dreaming of that great pot, idealizing what's the right material, reading up on it and trying to say, how do I make that perfect pot? And that pot was nowhere near as good as the kids who chose the quantity route, who said, Banao yaar, 70 kilos mar lagna hai. So like, you keep making pot after pot after pot. And as you do it, you get better. And as you get better, your pots suddenly start to look even better. So that by the time you're getting to that 60 and 70 kilos, your pots were far better than that, the group that had set out to make the perfect pot. And I think it's such a powerful lesson for us. And whether it's videos on YouTube, as Ali Abdal will tell you, whether it is writing, as the great Amit Verma will tell you, or whether it's speaking, as Brian Tracy might have told. You know, I think just going after quantity, being willing to make mistakes, being willing to get it horribly wrong, but just learning from it can actually help us to get to to a better place. 
Yeah, and as you've said in the book, quantity leads to quality. So my advice to any creator out there is don't don't overthink it. Like on one hand, it is of course true what Lincoln says that if I am going to cut a tree, I'll spend six hours sharpening the axe. And again, you quote that in your book, and I use that in some of my slides as well. Uh, but uh, so preparation and all of that is important. But at some point, there is a balance to be drawn between getting it done and getting it right. And I keep talking about this trade off in our lives. And I think in my own life, in fact, for most of it, I. I have made the mistake of you know thinking about getting it right and therefore never getting anything done and i think what's important is that y- you have to first get it done and getting it done again and again and again is actually the route uh, to sort of uh, getting it right the other uh, thing that struck me uh, as very interesting is that when you made your year end list 99 2000 whatever all these year end lists that you're making you said you would put things like um uh, waistline 32 or golf handicap uh, uh, x number or write a book and those are all goals and as as we both know by now uh, uh, you know it, it's thinking in terms of goals doesn't help you thinking in terms of processes does where you uh, you know you build a process and the goals kind of happen by themselves and they uh, fall into place i'm very curious to know what your processes were like not just in this later phase of your career but even earlier when you were in the corporate world like in terms of work ethic what kind of processes do you build for yourself are you building similar processes in terms of reading and in, uh, taking ideas you know what do you do for knowledge management at a time where perhaps there weren't any apps or fancy software for it what do you do now what are your processes through which you know you write these books do these courses you're obviously constantly modifying your content you've just started a youtube channel as well which i'll link from the show notes so godspeed for that what what, tell me about your processes that's what really interests me i like the point you make about how those lists that i had were goals and not processes and clearly i didn't know uh, no better as it were uh, and that that's probably why i put in put them there and i didn't actually put down that you know write four times every week or take golf lessons every week or what's your diet which is really the better way to get to the goals that i might have had but i guess the goals were at least served a purpose which is they kept me in focus of saying what do i need to do to get there and and maybe just get better with it in terms of processes maybe there are a couple of things that have become habits um, so as a young manager I remember if you walked into uh, a boss's in the good old days when laptops were still, you know, not yet around around us. If you walked into a, your boss's room for a meeting or a discussion, or if you walked to any meeting, it was expected that you'd carry a pen and a pad with you. You couldn't be walking in, flailing your hands and sitting over there and looking at the world. You had to have that pen and paper because if there was something that you needed to do, you would write it down. If there was something interesting you found, you'd write it down. If you saw a statistic which was interesting you'd put that down on a piece of paper. And I think that is something in some ways that has stayed with me. Uh, I don't trust my memory. And I guess over time, it just seems to be getting worse. And therefore, I think the need to write down something is a big one for me. And what I've done, Amit, is often if I see something interesting or if I if I see a line which might be an interesting one or I uh, hear something which is interesting, I will write it down. And I will then try and figure out, I may not even write everything, but I'll write en- enough of that line to be able to say, I know what, what this was. And very often stories uh, that I might share or ideas that I might propagate come from those little lines that might have actually cropped up somewhere. So this is the, really the crudest form. And then that became notes. And then, you know, I, I use Evernote, which is which I find is useful. I know that there are, you know, I'm, I, I'm a big fan of, of the idea of building a second brain, but I just find it too complicated. And I want to tell myself that maybe at this stage of my life, I don't want the process to hijack my agenda. And I don't want to be so caught up in saying I must get the better process. So long as I have something that works for me uh, and serves my purpose, I'm saying, you know, uh, this this is good enough, you know, and I I'm, I'm don't really need to move to Notion or, you know, or, or something. That's That's the way I see it. The other thing I've done in terms of processes, and I said this to you earlier, that I like the idea of being able to to kind of share what I have heard or learned, which is new for me. And therefore, uh, a lot of my conversations with friends, with, with, with other people who might be around me, family, whoever I meet, I will often share. Very often I'll tell my, if I'm driving in a car, I'll tell the driver something that I might have read because I think it might be interesting. And, and maybe this is, again, good old 
Hindustan lever training at work, which is to say, test your ideas, test market new launches. You know, don't try and suddenly say you've got this great idea and one day I'll go and say big bang, here it is. So I like the idea of being able to test it out. So I might even make a, I'll, I might even put it out on a LinkedIn post and just put out the send the, the kernel of an idea and say, see what, how do people respond? Sometimes you'll you'll figure that you got it wrong or that there's there's a logical error in what you're saying or people think this is rubbish. But you learn that bit before you actually take it out to the larger world. So that's something else that I find extremely useful, which is to share whatever I have. And that helps me to get some kind of instant feedback, test market results, as it were, in terms of saying, does this make sense? Is there an idea here? Very often, putting an idea out actually gets back a bigger idea. You, you put out something which you don't know how it will work and you just put it out there and somebody else will make something else out of it. Maybe people will see it very differently from the way you might have seen it. And just getting that fresh perspective, just getting a new idea, uh, suddenly says, hey, I had an idea, you have one, I can put these two together and now I have an even better idea than what I might have had. With. So that's something else that works. Can you give me an example of that? So um, I, I'm just thinking, I, there's an idea, I wrote something in, in one of my, in my second book, I think about lessons from a tea bag. Okay. And I think I had like, you know, leadership lessons from a tea bag. And this was born out of a line somewhere about how I read something is like a tea bag, put it in hot water and you'll know how strong it really is. And I thought that's such a powerful idea. And I said, now this is like sounding like a leadership idea. And then I kind of looked at what are the other lessons from it? And I had five lessons and I'm just thinking aloud now, but it would be things like, you know, the bag of the tea bag needs to be porous. You can have the best tea inside, but if the bag is not porous, it won't work. Suggesting therefore as a leader that you might have all the ideas and knowledge, but you need to be porous, need to share, need to get it right. I had things like saying at the end of a cup of tea, nobody ever said, wow, what a great tea bag that was. We'd say it was good tea. So, you know, as a leader, don't worry about being recognized as this great leader. Don't worry about being, you know, 40 under 40 cover of the magazine, et cetera, et cetera. Focus on building great teams. Focus on building great organizations. Focus on impacting other people. That's what people will remember. No one's going to say, wow, there is a great tea bag. So, you know, I had these four or five lessons. What I discovered was that as I started talking about it, you know, in the early years, people got fascinated. And suddenly when I finished, somebody will come and say, you know what? I can think of one more lesson, sir. And somebody will come up with another one and another one. And today I probably have like 10 lessons from it, which are probably very different from the four I might have started off with when I, when I, when I got this going. So it's just a case of, Literally, now the word became popular much later, but you know, crowdsourcing ideas suddenly started to happen. Wow, fascinating. Tell me now about your writing process, because you've mentioned that you were a reader when you were a kid. You liked to write, you, wrote, uh, you know, you enjoyed writing essays. Uh, when you were in IAMA, you did your, uh, the, the magazine that you edited and which I presume you also wrote for. How did your writing develop over this period of time, like right now, it's very crisp, it's clear writing. It, you know, it does a wonderful job of communicating ideas, of storytelling. There is no jargon. It's simple. Everyone can understand. Was it always like this? Is there a journey that you took to arriving at this? Did you consciously think about what your writing voice should be like? Give me a bit of insight into that part of your process. First up, of course, getting a writing guru to say that he thinks this writing is pretty good <laughs> is like, I'll take that, Amit. Thanks so much. Thanks for those kind words. Uh, I, I, I must confess, I, I, ne I didn't read too much fiction as a kid. Uh, a lot of my reading was, uh, was magazines, was nonfiction, newspapers. So if you ask me who were some of my favorite writers as a, as a kid growing up, um, I, would, I would like to say I was a big fan of Dilip Bob, who would write for India today, you know, and I thought he wrote such, did such a great job of it. Or uh, a lot of Arun Shori and his research and his writing in, in newspapers at that time. I was a big fan of that kind of stuff. So for me, reading some of this was what got me excited. And, and I think at some level, keeping it simple was important. I like to say this. I, I give a lot of credit to my English teachers in school, perhaps. And uh, I, I'd, I'd probably call out, you know, there was a lady called Otti D'Souza and there was Sujata Mitra. And um, and they, they what they did for me was to say that, look, it's, it's the idea that matters. It's not about using big words. Um, it's about how can you, can you get that idea across to people who may not be familiar with what you're trying to say. And I think for me, simplicity therefore became a, uh, pretty much what I wanted to do. And 
I'd like to say this, that I sometimes think it's actually a very self-serving. If it was complicated, I wouldn't understand it. If I use big words, I probably wouldn't understand it. And that has kept it kept me on track to say that, you know, use words that, that you understand, use words that your reader would understand. I, I also think that, I don't think I consciously thought of my writing voice, but because I, I also speak, and I, I, like I said, a lot of my writing also stems from having shared that story or having told something. So I often think that I write like I speak. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, when I'm writing, I'm not thinking, oh, I'm now writing a book or uh, now this has to be serious. I still think I'm talking to someone and I picture my reader, which could be when my first book, when I wrote my first book, I thought of my 18 or 20 year old kids to say, I'm talking to them. What would I do? I would not use, if I wouldn't use big words if I'm talking to them. And I kept it that way. Uh, I like short sentences because it keeps it simple for me to ensure that I don't have to worry about grammar and syntax and saying, have you got this right? Or is that last part of the sentence fitting in with the first? Keep your sentences shorter and you take away the problem of trying to figure that out. So I think my writing style, therefore, has always been about keeping it simple, keeping making it sound like you're listening to me. And maybe without, like I said, without consciously realizing it, I, I'd i like to believe that that's the way it should be. If, for me, if, if someone reads what I've written, they must feel that I'm, I'm talking to them. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm having a chat with them, not even talking to them. I'm having, we're having this conversation. I'm trying to tell them a story. And that's really what you'll get over here. I probably learned this also earlier on that this is the idea of why am I writing this was not to try and impress somebody. It was not to try and tell somebody, look, everyone, look, I'm so cool. I can write so well. Or, you know, look, everyone, I can use such big words. That was not the intent. The intent was to say, you know what? I have something interesting to tell you. And let me try and tell you something which I think is interesting. Now, that was the brief in a sense to say, keep it interesting. You have an interesting story to tell. Make sure it's interesting for the other person. The other person doesn't have to tax her head and scratch her brains to figure out kya ho hai, what happened. Oh, sorry. What was this? What's, how does this fit in? Keep it simple for them. One last thought, which is, um, and I think I'm trying to now trace this back and, uh, you know, it's easy to keep looking back and saying, where did this start? But um, I, I wonder if as a little kid, being this kid who would try and pun too much, you know, would try and, you know, and everyone hates a punster and it can be a pain in the neck. And, you know, you can, we, your pun is indeed lowest form of humor and all of that. But I used to be this kind of guy who would always see something else in that word. And I would always see another, if somebody said something, I would probably say, that's what you're saying, but here's what it could mean. And I think this, this tendency to listen to that song in Hindi and to quickly try and say, how would this sound if it had English lyrics, right? Uh, what would it do? This ability to look at something and say, what does this tell us about the larger world? Maybe that is something else that has kind of become what gets me going in my writing, where I try and say that, look, maybe there's a lesson to be learned here. Maybe there's something that's important here, but it comes from something else which is happening. And I try and bring that to life and say, Hey, if that's what it is, how does this, what does this tell us about, about life, about relationships, about leadership, about the way we are, about the way we behave, uh, the way we think. I try and see if I can find lessons in that. And maybe that's something else that that's kind of seeped into the storytelling that I, that I enjoy doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's kind of fascinating. Number of things to take away there. And one which I find particularly interesting is this notion that your mindfulness of language can increase because you were a punner. Like I also, of course, don't approve of puns. And very often it's just the writer drawing attention to their writing, which detracts from the narrative and you don't really want that. But at the same time, it's important and it's important for writers, especially to look at with granular detail at the language that they are using and to have a sense of what effect their language has on the reader because every choice that is made in a particular piece has an effect on the reader and you want to be mindful of that so this is an interesting angle that tendency for sort of fancy writing doing you know writerly florid prose i think perhaps i have often mused comes from that old post-colonial hangover 
where for decades and to some extent even now english was a marker of class and uh, you know in india and if you wanted to signal your sophistication you do it with these big fa- fancy pompous phrases instead of saying you know stop this nonsense you'll say put an end to this pontificatory blah 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 and uh, so on and so forth and uh, again right as you speak is something i talk a lot about because i think people misunderstand it people think that right as you speak means that uh, the way that we are speaking you write like that and obviously Honestly, that won't work because there'll be all these long run-on sentences. There'll be these uh, sort of pauses and ums and ahs and words like like and whatever. Because when we are speaking, there's no filter between uh, our brains and what we are saying, which is fine because we are saying it in the moment. Uh, what right as you speak really means is that when you read something out, it should sound as if it is something that you would say in conversation. It should sound natural to you, which is why for most of the writers that I read, including you, most of the writers that I know personally, rather, including you. you know when i read something by them i can actually hear it in their voice because it is so sort of uh, natural to them and i think people lose this people try to be like too writerly and they tr- like i think william zinser once said that if there is a word that you would not use in conversation never use it in uh, your writing and i uh, agree with that you know so all uh, great points and great lessons in there i must ask you a question here amit and it's something that i'm sure. not i'm not really uh, thought too deeply about but i've sometimes wondered so when i went to school in and i learned english i i've never studied ren and martin and grammar yeah. and i i didn't really understand what you know past perfect and pre, pre, you know all the terms that we used to describe i've never studied or learned that and i find it fascinating that without having learned that as it were i learned how to read and write a little bit uh and i'm just wondering how does this fit in with with this whole thing about saying that if you need to know something you need to understand the science behind it perhaps or is is how does this work i actually think that uh, taking ren and martin too seriously for example might be counterproductive because what each of these grammar books or right like this books will give you is an ossified version of language is a convention of a previous time i think the way we learn everything is by reading a lot there's no substitute for that we learn how to write by osmosis by reading a lot and that reading can be mindful where you know arundhati roy after she won the booker in 96 for the god of small things once said that the quality of her reading changed when uh, she became a writer which means that you're looking for all the things that writers do the tricks they use how they build rhythm how they do transitions how they tell their stories all of those things but for me any kind of reading is great even mindless reading like i'll often tell participants of my course that do not become very conscious about what you are reading or think that some things are infra dig and some things are things that you should read read anything that you enjoy reading because anything that you enjoy reading is by default doing something right and you learn osmosis from that so whenever somebody asks me how do i improve my grammar how do i improve my vocabulary the answer always is that there is no instruction book which will teach you all of this you just read a lot and you kind of learn it by osmosis which is why i am never critical of a person whose grammar is in great who are making grammatical errors or whose uh, may not know many big words i'm never critical of them because those are things that you pick up along the way what is more important is the honesty in your storytelling that are you putting yourself at the service of your narrative or are you trying to impress somebody with oh look what a good writer i am i know all these big words and fancy phrases so yeah so my short answer uh, i gave a long answer but the short answer would really be that we learn by osmosis true so tell me about this particular book you know you've referred in this book to things that uh, at some points you'll say april 2020 this happened or you know you you've referred to the lockdown and the pandemic times and all of that how did the idea for this book kind of come about you know and what was the process of writing it like and is there something that this book has gained from being written after the pandemic began when let us say that you know the old normal became the new normal that is such a cliche i even i feel embarrassed using these phrases but you know is there something in the book that uh, was formed because of uh, that period uh, the first bit is that as my penguin editor will tell you that the the pandemic ensured that i wrote the book so it's <laughs> so it's been a bit in a, a fair a fairly long time in the works and it's been an idea but i guess uh, when the pandemic hit and you suddenly realize that you have a little more time on your hands you're at home i think it just took away one more excuse and as i looked at uh, so if i flash back to to april last year 
And I told myself that the world is changing a little bit. No more travel, no more having to be on flights all the time. You're at home, you're doing everything sitting in front of a computer. So it's a great opportunity to do a few things. And those few things included learning new stuff. Uh, so I said, hey, what can you learn? So I tried to learn two or three things that, that might have helped. And I told myself, not a bad idea to say, let's finish the book now. So let's get that book out uh, and start writing. So I think that the discipline probably got a little, got some impetus thanks to the, to the pandemic. Did that in any other way um, influence what I do? I think a lot of it goes back to my, my little attempt to try and say that I actually think there are things people need to know and we don't get taught those things. And, and sometimes just being just a little thing someone tells you can make it so, so much more powerful. I'll give you an example and I'm not saying this because I'm on your podcast, Amit, but just this, it, it never struck me that adverbs are bad yeah? until, I, until I took that course. And, you know, and to, to answer that question about Atul Beda Day and Sachin Tendulkar and all of that, I think if you don't get your hand in line with your foot, no matter who you are, you're going to be in trouble. And I just think that one little thing told me so much about, about my own writing. And, I, and it, I used to feel bad when I'd get rid of those adverbs. I thought they were adding so much to my, to my writing to realizing that, you know, it's such a drag. Just take it off. Horror of horrors. I did a count once when after I wrote something and I had something like in a, in a 700 word piece, I used the word just 14 times. You know? Just like that. And I thought it sounded just right. And anybody who said it's not right, I'd say, you know, you must be just kidding. You know? And I did realize it. So that's, that's my point. That sometimes you're not aware of some of these things and it's not... And I could turn around and say that this isn't rocket science and, you know, surely someone, I could have picked it up, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem is there are some simple things that we need to know about what we do and no one tells us that, yeah. And, we, and it, just don't, it just so happens that we, no one tells us. If, they, if we knew it, it could make a difference to our life. And it's not to suggest that this is the one thing you need to do and this will change your world. That's not the intent. These are small things that I think we all need to know. And, and that's really what got me started on saying, so what are some of the things that I might have learned, which I think could be useful? And, and that's how I started to write. Um, I think a good, a, a good practice in this was also to say that push yourself to write. And I wish I'd be a little more consistent, but some of the best moments I've had or the best months I've had are when I would tell myself that I will write something every day on LinkedIn. You know, I would just post something. And here's the interesting bit, and this is true, whether you're, you know, if you want to write a book or if you tell yourself that you'll write posts on whatever's your medium of choice, if you sit down on the first day to write, you'll say, I have nothing to write about. There are no ideas and there will be no ideas. And then you can get up and go and say, I have no idea, so I'm not going to write today. But if you force yourself to sit there and say, failure is not an option, you, there is no cop out, okay? You have to write that piece today which could be 100 words or 200 words or whatever it is, but you have to write it. And suddenly, something will come to your mind and you'll write a 30, 40 words, which will be rubbish. But those 30, 40 words will tell you that actually there is another idea coming from here and that will then become a piece. And by the time you're finishing, you don't want to get up because you think you've got something really nice happening over here and you want to kind of stay with it. And there is another idea that you've got from here. And, and I think that, can become a great way to tell yourself that, hey, this book can happen. And for me, very often, if I sat there and said, I need to write a book, I can't decide what to write about. And it's not like the book started by saying, I have a great title. How come no one told me that? All I have to do is to think of stories that will fit into that. That's not how it happened. I just had to think of what can I say? And gradually, I think one thing leads to another and to another and to another. And all of that happens because you tell yourself, you have to sit and write. And I think to anybody out there who wants to write a book, and I often, you know, and I'm sure this is advice you also gave us and you give everybody, which is to say, if you want to write a book, first, just write. We worry about, will, uh, will I find a publisher? Will the book sell? You know, how is distribution? What are royalties? How much margin? Forget all of that. If you want to write a book first, just write. The rest of it will take care of itself. Yeah, And I think if, if we can do anything, and maybe this is true, not just for writing, it's true for anything else. I'll give you another one, Amit. And, you know, after one of my books, I, have, I was in, in Kathmandu for a Nepal lit fest. Okay. Rare occasion when someone who's written an ordinary book on nonfiction gets called to a lit fest. But for me, the high point was that Shobha Day was there. 
And she was a fellow speaker at that Lit Fest, which also meant that, you know, the budget's being small for the organizer. They had one car to ferry us from one place to another. Uh, you know, I wasn't complaining and I'm hoping Shova wasn't either. But as I was talking to her, so she said something, you know, we all, uh, you know, and again, I'm saying this as a young kid, I thought Shobha Day was this great, you know, was a fabulous woman. And whether it was Celebrity Magazine, which she started, or just Neeta's Natter and Stardust and, and all of that. Forget the books. I thought she was, she was terrific. And a big fan of all that she did. And, and you know a little bit about her, you know, the books she writes, the, her, her husband, society. She's obviously this, you know, socialite, all of that. And I'm sitting over there with her and we're talking about something. And she tells, she tells me something. She says, you know what, Prakash? I write 3,000 words every day. It is a must. It could be a column. It could be a book. It could be a piece that somebody has commissioned. It could be notes to myself. But I will write 3,000 words every day. I will not go to bed if I haven't written 3,000 words. And then I can remember picture her saying this. And she says, it's like riyaz for a singer. You know, if you have to be a singer, you have to do your riyaz. For me, this is my riyaz. And here I am running a company and writing a book and thinking, you know, this is all cool. And I say, wow, yeah, this is this is such a powerful thought. And every time I tell my, if I'm now when I try to write and I'm thinking of an excuse, I think of my, think of saying, my diary is not half as busy as Shobha's diary might be. And if she can find time to write those 3000 words, you know, what's my excuse? Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, that's both uh, something to learn from and something not to learn from there. And what one can learn from there is, of course, the importance of riyas. Like I keep saying, like to me, the facility to write is like a is, is akin to a muscle. So if you want to grow your writing muscle, uh, you know, you have to do what you do to grow your other muscles. You you don't take a gym membership and without going to the gym by having an intellectual understanding of how the body works, grow your muscles. You got to go to the gym every day and get the job done. Similar thing with writing. However, 3000 words a day is intimidating like uh, the advice that I gave in my course and I have a slide just for this so, you know s uh, spoiler for those who haven't attended it yet is set a really modest target like what I say is 300 words a day or even 200 words a day you know just write 200 words a day and the thing with that is that many days you'll write more than that many days you will be in a difficult situation where you have fever and you're in bed or you have flights to catch in a post-covid world obviously and you know but you can still take out your phone and write those 200 words on your smartphone and in fact since I started speaking after you finished I have probably spoken twice as much we speak around 200 words in a minute it's very easy to write but what it does and even if you have nothing to write about write a daily journal write about what's been happening in your life the point is number one the juices are flowing the muscle is working out number two it accumulates even if you write exactly 200 a day and nobody will obviously stop at the 200th word if it's and or but but even if you were to write Right, that much that's 75,000 words in a year that's like a novel length thing you know so the important thing is like you correctly said just get out there just do it every day the process is what matters the goals will happen by themselves I, 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 I know you said this Amit and I remember you telling us in this course why 200 words is an important one was I remember you said even if you're going back to the airport after a meeting you know 200 words is something you can type out onto your phone right so you just take away the excuse for not writing. And I think that's a great start. But here's the interesting bit. I have found that once you get into the swim of things, once you get into the habit, you start saying, wow, I, there is more to say. There is more you want to do. And that 200 will soon become 500. And once you become class five, it'll become 700. And then if you become postgraduate, like Shobha probably is, it becomes 3000 words. But the second bit I want to say here is that Apart from the writing bit, the big problem most of us have is when you sit down, you wonder, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to write. What will I write about? Right? And that becomes a reason. So we wait for once I have something to write about, then I will sit and write. And I'm saying maybe you want to switch that. Sit to write and something will come to you. It may not have been there. I have found this happens to me so many times, you know, and There'll be days when I say, gosh, I haven't written. I must write today. I'll get up in the morning and I'll tell my wife I have to write. I'm not going for a walk in the morning. 5, 5 a.m. I'm sitting at my desk here. I don't know what I'm going to do. But I'm sitting over there and I'm saying I need to write. And surprise, surprise, something will come. And I think that's something else that maybe, you know, anybody who wants to write should try and figure this. Don't wait for that idea. And I'll tell you another little story, uh, Amit. I once was, I was on a flight and 
the gentleman sitting next to me, and this is the good old days when, you know, I'm still corporate and, and jet airways is still a thing and business class is still a thing. And I, surprise, surprise, there's this man sitting next to me who looks very much like Gulzar. And, you know, before I know it, the lady who's serving us gives him the glass of fresh lime and says, uh, is there anything I can get you, Gulzar Saab? And I think my flight is made. I'm going to really going to enjoy this one. And I find that, you know, Gulzar Saab has this diary, like a loose leaf diary, a handbook of sorts, which he's got with him. And he plonks that into the pocket in front, as even as he settles into a seat. And I'm curious. And I ask him, you know, why have you got that diary? And he's got a pen, nice looking fountain pen. And I said, is it because mid-flight, you might have this great idea or a line might occur to you and you don't want to lose it. So you want to write it down. Is that why you have that? He says, Nahi, janab, mujhe kaam hai. I have to deliver three songs by the end of the day and I have work to do. So I have to sit and write. Aisa nahi hai ki main idea ke liye wait karunga. Main likhunga, to shayad idea aa jayega. You know, and I think that's a, if it happens to someone as great as, 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 as Gulzar, maybe it's an interesting one for all of us to consider that don't wait for inspiration to strike before you write. Sit down to write and I think inspiration will find you. Yeah, in fact, in my course, I have a slide which has a quote by uh, Joan Didion where she says, quote, I don't know what I think until I write it down. Stop quote. So, you know, even if you have nothing to write about, just, just you know, sit, exercise that muscle. And magic will eventually happen. You've got to kind of have that faith. But don't start with a big target. Start with a small target. The big targets will happen. 3,000 words a day can also happen. More than that can happen. Uh, Like one of my favorite writers is a French novelist, Jorge Simenon, who wrote some 400 novels in his time. Created the detective Megre, but also wrote a bunch of, I think they're called Romana Durs, which are these wonderful novels about everyday life. And uh, he gave an interview to Paris Review when he was, I think, around 50 years old. And his process then was he would call his doc when he felt ready to write a novel. The doc would take the blood pressure, give the go ahead. And Simenon would then lock himself up in a room for seven days, like his wife would leave food outside the door. And he'd write 7,000 words a day. And at the end of a week, he's got around 50,000 words, send it off to the publisher calls a doctor doctor comes takes his blood pressure says okay you need to rest till so and so date and then I will come and check you again but this is one of those things which I would say please do not try this at home you know start small start achievable otherwise you know what a big target does to finish that thought is let's say you set yourself a big target I'll write thousand words a day also okay you set yourself that target you will fall off the wagon there will be days when you just can't and then you start beating yourself up and then you say yeah writing life is not for me like my corporate mein acha kamara ho, why should I do this and that affects your self image and it becomes a vicious cycle where because you don't write you tell yourself you can't write and that feeds into itself so the one way to break that is modest targets let's start by talking about your book and When I read the book, in my mind, I was sort of dividing it into personal lessons, that is self-actualization kind of lessons and other lessons, outward facing lessons like leadership lessons and team building lessons and all of that. And some of it struck me and what I again love, how you bring your own personal stories into these, like to give you a point of feedback for your next book. The whole, your entire book is filled with stories, but the stories that I really enjoyed were, were the personal ones and not so much, you know, the ones of other people and other things because there's just so much charm to them. And one of those stories was you talk about how you've gone on a drive with your twins. Uh, I think their nicknames are Abby and Toots. I hope they don't mind. I'm just quoting you. So at one point when you're going back to the car, your daughter says that, hey, I want to sit on the right side because you both sit at the back. And then the son immediately says, no, no, I want to sit on the right side. And uh, back and forth kind of happens and you find a compromise and you get to the car. And when you get to the car, your son says, by the way, which is the right side? Which is such a remarkable story and which tells you so much about human nature that he just wanted to sit on the right side because that's what his sister wanted. He didn't even know what the right side was. And similarly, in our lives, we set our goals and our benchmarks and our desires by what other people around us are doing. And your point there is be mindful of this and avoid this trap and so on. Tell me a little bit more about this and does this have personal resonance beyond this little story about your kids like do you think you made this mistake sometimes and you know what was the nature of the mistake how did you get past it I think it's it's such a a small a tiny little story uh, and it actually you know it has it certainly has reverberations across everything that we do and it certainly it has for me personally speaking it has for all of us I, I, I think if you look at the number of people who end up doing engineering 
you know, why do they do engineering? And if you look at the way we, we select careers, jobs, it's almost like, and I, I said this at some level that as a kid, if you're first in class in a, in, or second in class, you don't, in, in, like I said, South Indian middle class home, Bombay school, you don't do arts. You don't do arts. Why? Because it's not the done thing. It's not, you know, it's not, you do it because everybody wants it. Why do people want something? Because everybody else wants it. You have hot jobs, you have hot careers, you have employers who are being sought after, courses being sought after. Because everybody wants it, we forget whether it's something that suits our, is that what's going to make me happy? We don't even pause to think about it. And, and, I, and I think it's, I'm sure it's happened to me in my life. There have been decisions where you do things because everybody's doing it. You don't want to miss the bus. You, you worry that you might miss the bus. I also think that, again, optimist, positive and all of that. So I don't have too many regrets in my life. And I, I keep thinking that Johua, it's taught me something which has helped me to be where I am today. And therefore, that's, a, that's, that's been, you know, value for, for time and money spent over there. But I do think that in a lot of my decisions, a lot of our decisions, it's not, a, I wasn't this young person who kind of said, I don't care. I will do what my heart says. I will, you know, I don't care. I don't think it, I was that kind of person. And it's not easy. I think there are a lot of pressures, but I think just being aware of it can sometimes make it, you know, if you took 10 decisions, which were of that kind, maybe uh, awareness that, don't do something because other people want it. Don't do something just because if other people want it, you don't want them to get it. You want to get it before them. If they are, you know, very often you see this happen in, in so many ways in our lives that people will get possessive about something the minute they realize somebody else wants it. They may not have any use for it, but if somebody else wants it, it suddenly becomes something that we need. You know, and I'm just imagining in a middle class home, you know, if you went to your, I hope it doesn't happen too much. But, you know, you can imagine this where you go and say, uh, you know, can I borrow your toaster for a few? Nahi, kya hai na? Just now my daughter is doing a course in making sardo bread and all of that. So we are eating a lot of bread now. So I can't give you the toaster. Actually, I only realized I have a toaster at home and you asked me for it. But that tells me that I need it. And maybe there's a mindset thing here. That if you want it, maybe it's got value I hadn't seen and I want to hold on to it. And that and that came through for me in, in something as simple as this to say, like, you know, and it happens to all of us. I think there's, like I say in the book, there's a little bit of that baby Abby in, in all of us, you know, who's looking for things uh, without knowing why he wants them, who wants them because somebody else wants them. No, it's part of human nature. Like there's another story in your book where you talk about hanging around outside church gate just to see how uh, the markets are functioning. And uh, you you look at this textile shop where there are these three, four busy buyers and they buy something and then many others come and they buy the same things. And on the second day, you realize that these guys aren't buyers. They're actually pretending to be buyers so that other people imitate them. And uh, it's, it's kind of worth thinking about these aspects of human nature because the moment someone like you points them out, then someone like me can actually absorb that tendency in myself and can correct for it. So that's kind of invaluable. Another of the really interesting personal lessons that you have in here is about alteration tailors. Tell me a little bit about this insight and how it struck you. So uh, it actually, like, like a lot of these ideas or articles, they can stem, stem from a simple, a silly line I might have read somewhere. And I still remember this was, I think, in ET. ET used to have this glossy supplement called panache which would have you know good looking people with the top five suit brands and all of that happening in it nothing to do with business but all all about this the the glamorous side of business as it were there was a, a column there by a stylist and she talked about her five top tips for you know as style tips and one of those five tips was get yourself an alteration tailor and I thought that was strange, you know, never thought about it. And the rest of it was more standard stuff about, you know, dressing for the occasion, color, color and all of that. Get yourself an alteration tailor sounded odd. And the point she made, and I think in very brief was that, you know, that alteration tailor will make sure that that shirt sleeve, which is slightly longer, gets shortened so that it looks smarter with your jacket. That was the kind of thing. And I thought of that. I said, you know, wow, great idea here. And how important it is. And, and in many ways, how we all need an alteration tailor. So it could be to say, sometimes, you know, we all have that shirt lying in our wardrobe, which we don't wear because one button has gone missing. 
and therefore, or we wear it and we ensure we fold up, roll up our sleeves because I can't keep them down because that button is missing. And all it took was maybe someone who could be an alteration tailor and fix that. It could be this thing about you have a trouser which is, you know, just that half inch too long. And if it therefore doesn't fall as well as it, it doesn't make you look as smart as it could. All it takes is someone to just point it out and reduce that half inch. And I took that now to say that, you know, it's not only about our clothes. It's about us here. We need an alteration tailor in our lives who will tell us about those little things that we're probably not doing right. You know, and it's not this grand fix. It's not saying, oh, if I need to get better, I need to now enroll for the advanced management program at Harvard. That's going to change me. No, what you sometimes need is a friend, uh, someone close to you who can point out, you know what? Might be a good idea to just pause a little before you kind of lose your cool. Just relax, you know, or... You may not realize it, but you know, the way you say it, you might be sounding like you are, you know, you are being arrogant about what you know. These may be small fixes, but you need someone who will tell you that, you know what, there's a half inch that needs to be adjusted and here's how you can do it. And having that alteration tailor in your life is such a powerful thing because you will have somebody who's, who's kind of watching out for you, who's telling you. And it, sometimes it could also be to say that, you know what, that shirt you haven't worn because you think it's, it's too tight. Let me make it all right for you. You can wear it. It's like saying, maybe you have strengths you haven't leveraged. You're not sure of yourself. And I'll tell you, you know what, you're very good at that. Every time I've seen you do it, you do it well. So maybe you want to do more of it. So I just think that little line about saying an alteration tailor is a good style tip. I think for me was terrific advice. And I would, I, I'm grateful for it. And if you now look back, I'm sure we can all relate to the fact that, hey, there was an alteration tailor in my life who made a difference. And maybe you want to make sure you still have that person. You know, it's, it's, it's never, we are never finished products in that sense. And it's a great idea to say, I have an alteration tailor who will help me to identify what are those small tweaks that need to be made and who will help me to get it right. So that was really the story around the alteration tailor. Yeah, that's a lovely thought and a lovely phrase behind it. And I'm just thinking aloud that the kind of alteration tailor that I need right now is really a gym instructor who can make me fit my clothes <laughs> rather than make my clothes fit me. This lockdown has really, you know, some of us have expanded in unexpected ways. <laughs> Uh, you know, I've, I've taken I took copious notes on your books, but if we go through all of them, we'll take like, uh, you know, another three hours just to get through the insights. And I would rather that people listening to this go out and buy the book and sort of uh, learn from it themselves. I mean, in a sense, I'm, I'm just thinking aloud, you are an alteration tailor for so many ways at scale, you know, in a remote kind of way, uh, sharing these sort of insights, uh, which is wonderful. So, you know, there are plenty of insights in your book which uh, are great for personal uh, growth which are great for leadership building teams you know making better decisions all of those things i'll leave it to the readers to head over to the book and discover that they've got a taste of it i'll end with two final questions and one is that something that i spoke about in my last episode with roshan is how we live in this brave new world for creators and for some of us, certainly for me, I realized so much more of this after the pandemic happened, where serendipitously, you know, I started the course and I started consuming much more content that creators were putting up on YouTube and elsewhere. And just the way the possibilities had expanded and you know, the landscape had changed. All of it kind of blew my mind. Now, you are a creator yourself. You're a creator in the sense that you've done these books, you've created these courses, you've got a YouTube channel, so on and so forth. Incredibly exciting times. And so so for you, while you might look back to mine, uh, what has happened in your uh, life for content, uh, a lot more of it is basically just going to be looking forward because, hey, it's so exciting. Tell me a little bit about this. You know, what do you think of this new landscape for creators from a personal point of view, from the things that you are going to do and that you're looking forward to? Oh, I, I completely agree with you. I think these are ex exciting times uh, for creators. I think the opportunities, uh, the platforms available, it's become so much easier to do stuff. Um, and you don't have to be terribly tech savvy or, you know, clued in or have the most expensive equipment to do stuff. I think very simple tools can help you to, to, to kind of produce. And, and I think it's, it's truly exciting times. What fascinates me is, of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about the next 60 years of my life. I think there is so much to do. I'd love to write a lot more. Um, 
I I'm only half, not even halfway through Ali Abdal's recommendation as far as YouTube, uh, you know, videos are concerned. But I'm 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 super excited by that, and I just think that um, it comes back to you in 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 several ways. And there are times when I do something and I figure that it hasn't really, you know, I think it's a great idea and it just doesn't work. And there's something else that I I, I talked about and. and suddenly you'll find that your neighbor neighboring auntie is sending it to you on whatsapp saying mere you know my son in the us sent it to me and i told him that i know this man why because that little video has gone viral and get has a life of its own now i think it's just fascinating to see how this might happen what it might do and i think it tells you that look just do it put out that video you never know what might happen with it something else that amit i've i've tried to do and i don't know you must check this i must send I try to say that hey, is there an opportunity to reach out to uh, to more people, in not from any other reason, but to say that look, maybe there are other people out there who need to hear this, and how can I reach them? So I try to do a chai with pai, which is the video that I, that I do on YouTube in Hindi, and and I just loved it, and uh, it's and I, I could worry about how many views will I get, and it's not as if suddenly you know I've hit gold dust or any such thing, but I think. i suddenly touched different people and there are another another set of people saying you know that they liked it and maybe there's an opportunity here to say look i could do something over here i've learned i i like i said i learned i signed up to learn writing in your writing course which i loved i signed up for a stand up comedy course and i just think that you know that's another place where you have this ability to look at something and find another meaning to it you take people down one path and take them suddenly take them somewhere else and you know in some ways i think it's similar and maybe that's something else so I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't bet against myself. And maybe a year from now, maybe two, you'll probably find something else happening. As far as, as I'm concerned, I, I, I'd, I'd like something else that you mentioned, and I'm, and I'm, I'm mindful of it, which is, you know, there's only so much that I want to do in terms of mining from the past, uh, because you know there is only so much that is. But I, I do think that there is so much I learn about, or I see around me every day, uh, and there's so much to learn, and there's so much to kind of make sense out of. and therefore what i see is what do i see my role it's not to say that you know what i was working in a in this organization i learned something and here's what i want to share that's maybe one part of it maybe it's a bit of it is done what i really want to do is to try and say let me try and make this simple for you to understand here's a powerful lesson but let me try and tell it to you in a manner that you will remember in a manner that you will relate to and to me that becomes then the role that i see myself playing this is not about saying look everybody look i've done it that's never been the intent i don't think i've and i've not done half the things that a lot of successful people in the corporate world have done so i can't even lay claim to that but what i try and do is to say hey here's something simple you know it's important and let me explain it to you in a manner which you will relate to and there is so much that's happening in our world now uh, which still needs for someone to try and make sense of and make simple sense of in a sense to make it easy to understand make it easy to remember and make it palatable to say that i am not here to tell you that this is how you should succeed in life or if this is the creator economy here are the five rules to succeed that's not what i want to do but i want to try and make it intuitive try and say here's something simple maybe it struck you maybe it didn't but you know if you if this kind of gets into your head it might find residence there and it might change the way you think it might change the way you you look at the world and for me i think that is perhaps the biggest piece here which is that a lot of times what you need to change is not to tell people how to do it and here's how you do it but to get them to think differently about it and often it could be to say you can do it uh, which sounds like such a boring motivational line you know you can do it and all of that but i think it's simply to say we all tend to think of our limitations we tend to think of why it can't be done we tend to think of what's wrong with the world and why it will prevent me from doing it and if you do that what happens is that you you know very soon you you become a fabulous lawyer for that and you, be, you build such a strong case that they win yeah and you end up saying oh you know i could have been the guy who did it i could have achieved so much if this was a different world but you know what the world is what it is you can change and you can make things happen and i think just reclaiming the power which is what i think the creator economy is doing in many ways is helping people reclaim the power to make a difference and i think it's there for all of us to claim 
Yeah, exactly. Inspiring words. And one of the things that I keep pointing out to, you know, everyone who signs up for my writing course is that there are some things which require natural talent. Like if you want to be a fast bowler, you've got to have fast twitch muscles. A batsman will need some hand-eye coordination. But for a writer, I don't believe that you need any natural talent at all. I think anyone can learn to write. It's just a question of hard work, applying yourself, you know, having the right approach to writing. And and that's, again, something that you just sort of uh, uh, spoke about that uh, people don't know how far their own capacities can extend if they just have the right mindset. So more power to you for, you know, uh, achieving all of these things. My final question and almost a predictable one is that, you know, listeners of my show are always hungry for book recommendations. Now, you have written books which some people would say have touched their lives or even changed them and so on. If I were to throw the uh, onus back on you, that what are the books that, you know, maybe change the way you think about the world or meant a lot to you or that you learned from or that you're simply so enthusiastic about that you are like, I have to share this with the world. You know, uh, do you have any recommendations? So I'm a big fan of Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, I love his storytelling style and the, his ability to pull together strands of research from, you know, from all kinds of places and then suddenly magically weave them into a narrative. So I'm a big fan of his writing, uh, his podcasts, uh, and I'd, I'd highly recommend Malcolm Gladwell to, to people. And maybe I also like the idea of um, writing not because of, not only f- for the manner in which it's been put together, but for the idea there. And I think it's so well done that you forget to look at the writing. And, you know, this is something I know, Amit, you 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 put very eloquently, W and not the WP, you know, window and not the window pane. And I think that's something that's such a powerful idea where you don't try and draw attention to the writing, but you try and look at the ideas over there. So I'm a big fan of this half psychology, half in, you know, so Dan Arely, for example, big fan of the kind of stuff that he he writes. Though he's gotten into trouble recently, you read about that? In the the sort of the data in his research. Anyway, the jury is out on whose fault exactly it is. But it's a lot of these behavioral psychology experiments have turned out to not be replicable. But anyway, I think yeah. even the ones that aren't replicable point to interesting core insights that one should at least think about. That's right. That's right. And I, I, I'll i tell you something else. As a kid growing up, one of my favorite writers was Busy B. You know, Behram Contractor, who would write this little piece in the afternoon papers at that time. And I, for me, that's a great inspiration because this ability to look at something small around you and make sense out of it and to try and make it interesting uh, and and to have a point of view, which I think is extremely important. So for me, I, I like the idea that somebody is saying something out of whatever whatever is being written. There is a point of view that's coming through. It is not always profound. It is often built on something which is very simple, everyday stuff. And yet... It makes you look at it and say, hmm, how come I didn't think of that one? Yeah, You know, uh, and that to me is, is in itself uh, very, very interesting. Great. So, uh, Prakash, thanks so much for your time and your insights and indeed for writing these books and all of that. I hope we continue to have many more conversations through uh, the, the next 60 years, you said, right? So, okay, <laughs> through the next 60 years, since you're optimistic for a moment, I shall adopt some of that uh, optimism for myself. Like that line went, why are you surprised, Amit? You look pretty fit, yeah? You'll survive the next 60, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, inshallah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. thank you so much, Amit. It's been so much fun uh, talking to you. It's been so much fun following you. And uh, may you continue to inspire a lot more people to write, indeed, to follow their passions and do all the cool stuff that you do. Thank you so much, Amit. Thank you. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, head on over to your nearest bookstore online or offline and buy How Come No One Told Me That by Prakash Ayer. In fact, just buy all his books. Uh, They're full of important life lessons. Also, check out the show notes and enter rabbit holes at will. You can follow Prakash on Twitter at Prakash Ayer, one word. You can follow me at Amit Verma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. You can browse past episodes of The Seen and the Unseen at seenunseen.in. Thank you for listening. 
Did you enjoy this episode of The Scene and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to sceneunseen.in slash support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.